Okay, good afternoon and uh, welcome to um, this first event um, organized by Arts ID together with Tech MT, Digital Shaping the Future of Art. Uh, thank you for accepting also to participate in, in today's session and tomorrow's sessions. Um, it's an exciting event and also um, it's also encouraging to see participants who are committed to spend their evening on a Friday night, early days of summer, um, to talk about the relationship between technology uh, and the future of technology and the future of art and, and how they, they, um, they intertwine in one way or another. So, um, so congratulations for, for this commitment and, uh, and we'll, we'll have some time as, as we go along, a couple of housekeeping, uh, where we will be able to, to take a couple of, of breaks in the process, but this is also a way how you could uh, share your thoughts and ask uh, any questions to, to the experts we have, to the panelists we have, to the workshop leaders. Um, and you can do this by um, uh, accessing the, uh, the, uh, the, the chat box um, or else raise your hand uh, to, to bring to my attention that, that you would like to, to intervene. Again, it's an open conversation in, in certain, uh, for certain sessions. Um, uh, other speakers, our keynote speakers, will also have, are being very generous in terms of providing some time for some questions. Um, so without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Maria Gallia, the founder uh, of uh, Arts ID and the brains behind this event. Um, Maria, are you with us? Can we see you? Yes, I am. We can see you. Hi, Maria. Thank you, Tony. Thank you for taking on this role. Um, I am sure you will bring very good vibe, vibes to this event. Um, thank you to all our speakers who will be sharing their experiences and their skills and their insights. Um, when when things were what we call normal, I always made it a point to travel in various countries, exhibitions, art fairs, museums, enroll myself in events, forums, and courses, and all of these um, nurtured my professional development, kept me updated with the latest trends, and built new relationships. In the past 15 months, I have done all this without the need for me to travel. Technology has allowed me and many within the international art sector to function, but also explore new methods of reach. However, this does not mean that I choose the virtual space over the physical space. This does not mean that I will no longer go to exhibitions or enroll in a course in London. Of course I will. And I am counting the seconds to do so. But what we all must remember right now is that these two realities go together and are in parallel. Um, art in general is made about experiences reaching new audiences and 90% of the global population is online. This ever-changing landscape has evolved in so, so many ways and today we'll be telling you a bit about each and different part of it. Works can be um, recreated in virtual spaces, we can sell our work online, we can protect the authentication of an artwork and so much more. In conclusion, I would just like to say, um, I know some of you get thrown back when they hear big words that are not easily understood. And terminologies in the digital world can feel a little cold. But just look beyond that. What matters here is your sustainable professional growth. So go for it and explore it. Before we start, I would like to thank Tech.mt for supporting this initiative. And I pass on the word to Dana Paruja, CEO at Tech.mt, who, who could not join us today, but she has sent, sent us a message to, to all of you. So I will be sharing this message with everyone. Okay. 
Art is a significant driver of innovation, and technology is one of its assistive tools. From maintaining and restoring previous works to creating visual effects, virtual reality and graphic creations, and also immersive environments. New artists explore new techniques and push frontiers of imagination, leading to new technological developments. And this is what we want to encourage you to keep doing. Technology is driving change in every industry, including the artistic sector. The global pandemic has pushed economies to new lengths, and artists like you have been affected both in their creative thinking side and also in their ways of exhibiting their creations. The upside of all this is that lack of physical connection has strengthened the relationship between arts and technology even more. We believe that art will become a major contributor to digital economies of the future, with unprecedented digital value and beauty being created as we speak. TechMT is pleased to be collaborating with ArtsID on this accelerator workshop. This collaboration stemmed from the mission to support artists to reach worldwide audiences and monetize online. We want to be part of your success in the digital area. TechMT is here to support you to broaden your digital horizons. I am looking forward to the beginning of a fruitful collaboration between TechMT and ArtsID. And most of all, I wish you all the success with your creation. Okay, I will leave the floor to you, Tom. Excellent, thank you for that wonderful introduction that really frames the conversations we'll be having in these two days. Um, I would like to introduce our first keynote speaker, um, and that's Mark Maro. Uh, Mark is with us, and uh, um, Mark is a digital artist and he's also an artist manager. And, and in his intervention, he will be sharing some thoughts on how he transformed his own career through fine art, sharing his challenges, um, but also success story uh, through the years. Um, Mark, the floor is to you. Hello, everybody. I hope you can see me. Um, and thanks for the preview of your real background. <laughs> yes. Oh, can you see the background? Is it well, we, well, we had a bit of a preview, and I absolutely love that. <laughs> okay. I'm glad we, we coordinated and wore stripes, Tony. Exactly. <laughs> we, we planned it all out. We, we did, did indeed. Yeah. I apologize to the viewers who actually may be like going, Oh, way too many stripes going on there. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I think before I talk about my digital art and my journey into art, I think it's worth me um, giving a little bit of an explanation about who I am and, and what I've done and how I've arrived here. Um, in fact, the majority of my career um, over 40 years has been at the very top of the UK music industry. Um, by the time I was 24 years old, I was the president, I was the managing director of a company called Blue Mountain Music, which was the music publishing rights holder for U2 and Bob Marley, amongst many others. Um, by 29 years old, I was promoted to the role as managing director of Island Records. And Island Records now, uh, these days, is one of the biggest record labels in the world. Um, and when I joined, it was an independent. Um, and that company was owned by one of the UK, well, sorry, one of the world's most um, what renowned um, uh, re record people, a guy called Chris Blackwell. Um, Chris had founded the company in 1959. And uh, by the time I got the managing directorship, we had a huge amount of success under our belt, but we were still independent. And we had U2 and Robert Palmer and uh, uh, Grace Jones, Bob Marley, Steve Winwood um, and, a, and a bunch of others too. Uh, when I got the job, my key talents, um, my role uh, was uh, actually talent. It was, um, it was running talent and finding talent and nurturing talent. In the music industry, it's called an A&R person, artist and repertoire. And that was my job. Many managing directors of companies come from different backgrounds. It could be marketing, could be legal, um, it could be sales. Uh, but mine was talent and that was particularly appropriate for, for the island records group because chris blackwell is viewed by many on a worldwide basis as being the ultimate talent um, spotter and the relevance to this is is because my my life in music started actually at believe it or not at art college so i studied art 
um, joined a rock and roll band and decided, had a choice to face really. Did I want to go into art or did I want to go into music? Um, and at that moment, I thought that I was going to be successful in music and I pursued that career. Uh, but uh, after a, a very short period of time, found myself actually really enjoying signing and developing talent and, and nurturing them and, and bringing talent to the marketplace. And the role at Island Records was complex because um, we were taken over in 1990 by uh, the, the world's biggest music company, which was Polygram, part of the Philips Electronics Group. Um, and this little independent Island Records suddenly became part of a, a beer moth, a huge business. Uh, and I had to navigate my way into it. Um, but we had a stellar time. Uh, one advantage of being a, a part of a bigger company is that they resourced us. So we had more money to be able to spend on the talent um, and on, on everything else that went with it from, you know, photography, videos, uh, recording budgets and everything else. Um, during my tenure, I ran Island Records from uh, 1990 to 2000. Um, and during that time, um, we had a great deal of success. And I'm not suggesting that uh, all of it will um, translate um, around Europe, but certainly from a UK perspective, um, we signed um, NWA for the world. Uh, we signed uh, people like uh, Pulp, Elbow, Tricky, PJ Harvey, Nine Inch Nails, um, Tupac, um, and the Cranberries. We, we had enormous success. And obviously we also had the continued success with U2. Uh, the very first album that I, that I was in charge of on a worldwide basis was Actum Baby. Um, and that included me helping them to make the record, but then also selecting the singles, um, selecting the photographers, the video makers and, and everything else. And that's actually really informed my art because over the last, um, I would say, uh, over that 10 year period, we worked on the basis that we released pretty much one single from an album per week, so 52 per year. And each one of those singles would have had a video made to it and would have had photography created. And in each and every case, um, I would have read at least between six and 10 scripts for every single one of those 52 per year times 10 years. Um, so I, I got to learn very, very, um, over a, a long period of time, what, what makes a, a typical um, three minute, 30 second long song work in terms of visuals and videos. Anyway, to cut forward a few years, um, I, I, when I quit Island Records, I started my own management business and I managed um, global superstar DJ Paul Oakenfold, uh, Cat Stevens, Yusuf Islam, um, I managed spiritualized um, uh, lemon jelly, and then later on um, managed people like Jesse J, Ella Henderson, um, and Becky Hill, um, all of whom have had number one singles in, in the UK. Um, but I was getting bored. I was not so much getting bored with music, but I was getting bored with the business of music because the music industry that I quit in 2000 on a global basis, the turnover was nearly $40 billion. Uh, by uh, 2014, that had dropped to $14 billion. So $25 billion per year had dropped away from the music industry through peer-to-peer -peer theft, and in particular through loss of control of pricing because of Apple. Apple took over pricing. It was the weirdest industry where you invest in a Rolls Royce, which is your U2 album, but you still have to sell it for the same price as a Skoda um, because that's the way that Apple designed the system, which of course really cut the heart out of the music industry. And I have to say, the, the, um, the thing that was most important to me um, was that I, I really um, learned over time um, that excellence was, was what was required. And in my boredom with the music business, I started looking around for excellent other clients. Um, I picked up a Formula One driver that I managed, Premier Division football players. And in the middle of it, a, a fine artist, um, a painter that I really admired called Scarlett Raven approached me and asked whether I would take her on. 
And my problem was, was that even though I loved art and knew quite a bit about it, I didn't really have uh, the infrastructure. If she had been a, a, a good looking young um, singer songwriter, I could have got any, any record company boss to return my phone call probably within a couple of hours. Uh, but starting with somebody in an, in an industry that was relatively new to me in 2014, by the way, uh, was complex. It was, it was difficult. So I said to her that I wouldn't take her on. I would try and loosely represent her, but I wouldn't contract with her until I came up with a big concept. And basically what happened was that, um, that uh, the, my company had three number one singles in a row. Uh, Jesse J, followed by Ella Henderson, and then followed by Becky Hill. And each, each girl knocked the other one off the number one slot. And when that happens, a lot of uh, brands come running because they think that you've got some sort of magic formula. And one of the brands was an augmented reality company called Blipper. And they brought along their demonstration and they tried to persuade me to persuade the artists and the record companies to take the, the technology seriously. The problem was, was that I couldn't get anyone to take it seriously. Um, they were all amazed when they saw it working, um, but they didn't really see how it was going to make any impact upon them. And I, of course, then remembered that I was working with this girl, Scarlett Raven. So I, I had that uh, leap of opportunity and imagination uh, to approach Scarlett to say, do you think there's something that we could do together uh, in fine art through augmented reality? I set up a rig for her so that she could create stop motion. The problem was, was that she had no idea really how to use the computer technology. Um, I had a, an interest in filmmaking and photography, so I was pretty, uh, pretty good rudimentary with, with filmmaking and editing. So I undertook to start um, creating the augmented reality with her. Um, we we uh, launched um, a few paintings at a private exhibition for, for wealthy investors. Um, and we sold them almost immediately for significantly higher prices than Scarlett had ever achieved before, because this was the first time in 2014 that anybody had seen art come to life in the way um, that we were making it come to life. We were using uh, an augmented reality app that you, you put headphones on, you pointed the app at the, the painting and the painting came to life with storytelling underneath. And our subject matter was difficult. It was First World War. It was something that I was personally interested in through a family connection. My, my grandfather, by marriage, um, survived the Battle of the Somme in 1916. And even though he was terribly wounded in the face, um, he was sent back and survived the rest of, the, of, of World War I. And his stories ended up in the National Archives in the UK as recordings, and I used uh, one or two of the recordings in, in, in the art. Um, I decided that from my rec rock and roll training, um, that I needed to be disruptive in other ways, not just augmented reality, which was disrupt disruptive enough, uh, but I raised a small fund and uh, was able to commission uh, a very well-known uh, 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 film set designer who, who had worked on major films like train spotting um, and she designed for me a burnt down bombed out destroyed building um, in picardy northern france in in uh, set on the eve of the battle of the somme in 20 in sorry 1916 and this five ton set um, became a, a really important part of, of how we presented the the paintings the paintings are um, beautiful four foot by four foot um, uh, all artist quality oil paints. Uh, they tend to be about an inch thick with oil and Scarlett paints them uh, in, in a, in a, with, with a camera on the ceiling and the, the canvas on the floor. And every touch of paint that she puts onto the canvas is then recorded and then turned into an animation. And then I add the stories. So my role um, is to then take the, the painting that, that starts with a white canvas and, and ends with a beautiful floral painting um, it is my, my role is to then try and make something uh, magical out of it, um, it, it, as if her painting isn't magical enough, which it is. So I started um, exploring some of the most uh, powerful World War I, uh, 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 sorry, poetry 
um, that, that I had learned about at school and had got very interested in. Um, and I contracted with some amazing talents in the UK, um, actors Sean Bean, Christopher Eccleston, Gemma Arterton, Vicky McClure, Sophie Ocanado. Um, these, these are amazing A-list actors, uh, Stephen Graham. Um, right now, there, there are Vicky McClure, there, there are three or four of them that are in major BBC and ITV series in, in the UK. And these um, wonderful actors then delivered the, this, this very distressing poetry in a, in a very emotional way. And so what we started out with, which is ra rather pretty floral pictures, when you held the app and you pointed at the, um, and you pointed at the, the, the painting, they come alive with real depth and darkness and uh, very emotional content. Um, and regularly, the content made people cry and weep at the, at the exhibition, which was not what we expected, but was, it was in fact real validation that the work was getting through. And I think part of the point that I'm making is that we as participants in this lovely conference, all aware of something like God monks the screen. And you can't help but be moved when you stand in front of the screen, you actually see the painting for itself. But you'd have to be pretty messed up to weep. Well, our work, our, our unknown work, made people weep on a daily basis, multiple times, um, multiple people. Um, and, and it's because in a way, using the uh, augmented reality technology allowed people um, to feel. We also worked with a wonderful composer called Mark Cannon, um, who's, uh, who's a, a bespoke um, film composer. He, he works on, on many great movies. He's just done a huge hit for Netflix called I Care A Lot, which was amazing. And Mark scored the music to each of these poems uh, bespoke. So they have a really uh, strong underpin of, of emotional music. Um, bearing in mind that Scarlett and I were both totally unknown in the art world, I approached Castle Fine Art, which is the UK's number one um, art distributor. I actually didn't know that they were the UK's number one art distributor until they saw the work and said yes <laughs> and, and took us on. Um, so they, uh, they have a sister company called Washington Green, who's the UK's foremost art print business, who create the work, create the prints for us. Um, and then Castle Fine Art have over 40 galleries in, in very prestigious uh, locations. They're, they're a sort of high-end art, art, art group. Um, and they took us on. So we launched our first exhibition in July um, in 2016, when we gathered together 12 paintings. That, that's, that's as much as we could do at the time. Um, and I borrowed a, a, a pop-up space from a property developer friend of mine in London and brought the, the five-ton film set and put it in there. Um, and Castle Fine Art were very kind to put a few of their top salespeople in for the month that we were going to be running the exhibition. And I know that this conference is, isn't about money, um, but it is important to actually talk about money. Um, the exhibition within its first six weeks, so the exhibition ran for four weeks, but within six weeks, uh, we had sold absolutely everything. So all 12 paintings had sold. Uh, the first two paintings sold for about £7,000 each at the private exhibition that we had. Um, and then the last one sold for 37500 So that tells you what the, sort of the curve was in, ter in terms of, um, of reach. But more importantly, we created 1,100 prints. So 100 three foot by three foot hand embellished box canvas. Uh, framed prints, um, which, which were selling for £2,000 each. Um, and we also printed a thousand um, beautiful paper G play under glass uh, prints as well. Um, so we had 1,112 things to sell, and within six weeks, every single one of 1,112 things had sold. And um, a lot of that obviously was coming out of the, the excitement of the exhibition. We had very good press, very, very good um, uh, reactions from people. But in, in fact, we were also incredibly well supported by Castle Fine Art across the country. We couldn't have sold all of that amount of work out of the exhibition. So ha having um, representation broadly across the country was really important to us. 
And of course, that led to other opportunities. Um, bizarre co connection, but the head of culture for the city of Liverpool saw the exhibition and then invited, invited us to exhibit in Liverpool. So later that year, um, in November, uh, we opened at the Martin Luther King Museum in Liverpool um, for a month. And we created uh, uh, a whole new range of work uh, for that because we had nothing left to sell from the first one. Um, and I'm very pleased to report that we had the same reaction, the same emotional reaction. Um, and then obviously the concomitant um, uh, commercial success that, w that went with it. And these things um, bred because the mayor, the mayor of Liverpool invited the mayor of Manchester to come and see the exhibition. Um, and that got us an invite to go to Manchester Central Library, which is an amazing space that had just been renovated in a multi-million pound renovation. And we got the first um, entry into it. We were there for three months. Um, but also the Liverpool exhibition um, was seen by the head of the Titanic Museum in Belfast, which is an amazing, one of the Europe's best um, um, exhibits. And we were offered three months uh, in, in the Titanic Museum in Belfast too. Bearing in mind that Scarlett and I completely self-funded. We, we're not, you know, we're not going to uh, pretend that, 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 that we had tons of money behind us. Anyway, listen, I'm going to show you um, a very short clip that which will give you a sense of it um, before I have to open up for questions. So I'm going to share the screen at the moment and just show you a little bit of us. This is, uh, sorry, we, we ended up uh, an, a, an amazing honour for us. We were invited to exhibit for three months at the National Army Museum in London. So that's a proper national museum. So we, 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 we had a fantastic run of 11 exhibitions, including three national museums. So let me just show you a little film about it. My name is Mark Moreau and I'm one half of an art duo with a wonderful painter called Scarlett Raven. She says she's the paint and I'm the pixels. I do the digitised side of it and Scarlett does the wonderful painting. We paint augmented reality paintings which are quite complex. Scarlett works with a camera on the ceiling and a canvas 12 feet below on the floor and every job of paint is actually photographed and captured and then stitched and woven into an animated story. I then introduce elements of digitization, so I introduce photography, film, uh, bespoke score for a wonderful film composer called Mark Cannon. Um, and I also introduce poetry because our field at the moment, our, our range of paintings, are all about the Battle of the Somme and the First World War. I went to the Danger Tree and I went to the Battle of the Somme and I stood amongst the trenches and where these poems would have been written, and it really um, brought home to me that these poems wouldn't have just been written by soldiers, you know, which is awful in itself, but by children and by artists and musicians and doctors and postmen and they're written by human beings and this, this whole exhibition isn't about defending a country and about war or supporting it, it's about defending humanity. My work is really sculptural and it always has been and I like, I want the paintings to grab the viewer and like stir them and make that as impression, be impressionable to them so they as a platform for them to delve inside themselves. And having gallery spaces and the confinements of white walls have always got in the way of my work and my concept of my idea. So again, collaborating with Mark and collaborating with the set designer Cave Quinn and the score and musician and Mark Cannon, we're able to create complete sensory. We're walking into a building that's been blown up from the First World War in France. And everything, the smell, the sound, everything echoes the paintings and vice versa. So it's beautiful to, you know, not, we're not in the confinements of the gallery anymore. The Danger Tree exhibition is significantly different from others because of our use of technology. When a visitor arrives at the show, we hand them an iPad and headphones and they get to see the paintings through the medium of the technology. We work with some of the best talent in the country, including Sean Bean, Christopher Eccleston, Gemma Arterton, Sophie Ocanado and many others. 
who have performed some of the most powerful World War I poetry, including works from Wilfred Owen, Siegfried Sassoon, Rupert Brooks and John McRae. Coming to the National Army Museum is such an honour for Scarlett and I, given that we started out in 2014 with no greater ambition than just to show the original 10 works that we created. All of our 10 exhibitions tend to show a similar pattern in the way that they organically link into each other. Somebody sees the show and recommends it to someone else and lo and behold, we've gone on a journey that ends up in this incredible space. Um, I think Sean Bean's The Poems, both of them were exceptional, but I think for me, the, the Liverpool Boys letter was just heart-wrenching to hear such despair almost in the letter and yet almost still telling people that not to worry. It was just, that's just that so powerful, it's scary. Right, so I suppose in conclusion, before we get to questions, um, the thing that's most important that I'd like to get across, um, and this is why I wanted to talk to you about a little bit about my music industry experience, is, is that I've taken a is that you, you, you don't stand next to artists, um, whether you're a musician or whether you're, whether you're a fine artist, it's the distance between, between you and them, not the, not the closeness and the similarities. My view is that excellence is, should be at the core of anything that anyone does. But everybody ought to be looking for a point of difference. What makes me different to uh, other people that are competing for the same wall space uh, and the same budget? It's my absolute feeling that, that trying to find something that's unique, that makes you stand out from the crowd, is the core thing. And augmented reality has done that for me. And I also want to say that I'm, I'm not alone doing this. So the BBC said that we were the first in the world, which was very kind of them in 2014. Um, I started working with the app company Artivive, who, who deliver all of the experiences for me. And when I started, they had about um, 15 clients they were working with, and they invited me. They tried to lure me away from Blipper and invite me into their, into their wall garden. And I joined and I helped them develop um, the app by, by you know, uh, road testing it. But the most important thing is that as of, so that, was, that would have been in about 2016. Um, in the five years intervening, um, they told me last week that they now have an ecosystem of 105,000 artists, all of whom are creating augmented reality on a, on a, 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 a weekly basis. And I think that's really important. And I, I want to sort of give you a sense of the economic scale of what we were able to achieve. You've got to bear in mind that Scarlett was an unknown painter. I was an unknown artist. I had a good idea, but it, but it was an unknown technology. And most importantly, it was a very difficult subject matter, the First World War. And yet we managed to have over 100,000 visitors over the 11 exhibitions. And we managed to gross uh, well over five million pounds, which for something that was completely nascent, unknown, nobody knew whether it was going to work, nobody knew whether anyone was going to care about it. Um, I have to say that Scarlett and I are both pretty proud of it. But it couldn't have happened if we hadn't have looked for that amazing opportunity. And of course, we found it in the digital world. And it, it was so amazing to be able to unlock um, uh, our, our career in arts through technology. And I guess what I'm saying to, to anybody watching this is, is, is the hope is that you can go out there and disrupt in the way, in the way that I disrupted. So kind of that's it from me, really. I'd love to have any questions from you. If there's anything that anybody wants to ask, I'm very happy to answer them. Um, let me know what you think. Thank you, Mark. Um, let's see if we have any questions for some reason I can't... Uh start my video but yeah i can okay um thank you mark for that really interesting insight into into your work and 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 how you've worked with other artists but also how you've engaged with technology um i don't know if we have any questions uh we do have let me see uh yeah we have a question by zach uh, what are your thoughts on augmented reality and nfts that's interesting zach um uh, my next um, iteration, it, it, one of the interesting things about doing this is, is that um, loads of brands have been started approaching me. Um, they've seen the work, they've been exposed to it, they know how it works. 
So approaches from companies like um, Samsung and Pernod Ricard and um, Hearst Media, all sorts of people. Um, and that led me to think that actually part of my next step is, is whilst I will absolutely categorically continue um, as an artist, um, is that I am creating a new business which is in exhibitions um, because of my connectivity to the rock and roll world to create the augmented reality uh, Amy Winehouse experience or, or the Bob Marley experience is an easy reach for me. Um, so NFTs are, are going to form a very major part of that. Um, at the moment, the NFT world is, is the Wild West. Um, it'll calm down. And I think that NFTs are going to be very important for all of us, everybody watching this at some point in the future. And of course, doing what we're doing with augmented reality, that there is real perfect um, uh, NFT um, uh, uh, connectivity. You can, you can see why it, why it works. Um, so yes, NFTs are going to be huge on my agenda over the next five years. And I'm working with a company uh, called Blockpool, who, who are... Um, preeminent in the UK in, in that NFT area. And so whilst I can't announce yet what the solution is, I'm working on it. Excellent. Any other questions? Um, I'd like to pose a, a question myself before we have any other interventions. Before you mentioned the kind of your distance or different distances between you and other artists, um, what about the distance between art and technology? How has that changed in, in your career and, and how do you see other artists engage with technology? It's funny, it, it's, a, it's a sort of personal choice really, uh, Tony. Um, way back in the day, um, I, I became very interested in the internet before the graphical interface in, in 1995. So I was an internet user in the early, in the early 1990s. In 1995, um, when the graphical interface was sort of finally connected, I used my own credit card to purchase u2.com URL, islandrecords.com URL. So I effectively could have cyber squatted on some very valuable properties there. But I realized what the technology was going to do and I gave u2 as a gift, their own URL. And I gave the same to, to, my, to the company as well. Um, and I spotted, and, and I built, in fact, uh, island.co.uk island was the first ever major label website to be built. So that tells you what my um, involvement in technology was and, and how, how much I uh, swear by it. Um, when I left Island Records, the very first job I was given was U2 to thank me, asked me to build u2.com, which I did. So I've, I've been a great, you know, uh, believer in technology and I'm always interested in it. The trouble is, is, is that there are a lot of people that aren't. And so you've, you've kind of got to find your own route in it. Um, I think that, that wearables are, uh, are going to become huge for all of us within the next five years. Um, they, they may still be only a couple of years away that the Apple glasses and the Samsung glasses and the Facebook glasses get commercially launched. But when they do, um, they're going to change the world because they will become ubiquitous. They will look like glasses. They won't look like goggles. And they will serve augmented reality. When you're walking through your local supermarket, the, uh, the advert for apples will start singing at you and there'll be nothing you can do about it. So we, we all need to kind of get a grip and get on with it as far as I'm concerned. But is, it, is, is augmented reality going to become or even more like the medium itself? Are we looking at replacing it? Because even the examples you show, no, it's, an, it's still in a physical space, but still bringing these different experiences together. And is there anything wrong with shifting to an augmented reality space from a physical space? No, but I still personally think that the magic of, of augmented reality is, is when you're in reality, you're in a physical space, which is why I built that film set. And, you, and when you're, you may come in with a group of three people and, you, and you're all given um, headphones and iPads and you're, you're actually separated from each other. Um, and you're in reality, but you're pointing your, at your uh, device at a painting and suddenly you've got a very emotional music, very emotional poetry and a very powerful performance. It's transformative. And so I, I personally really like um, being in the real world with, with it. Um, I don't consider 
that I make videos, I do consider that I make paintings. And, and it's just a different way of delivering it. So I, I very rarely like to show my work on YouTube for argument's sake, because that's just another video. Um, it's much better to see it in the flesh and in reality. And then it's, it's very impressive and can be very moving. Excellent. Um, I don't know if we have one other question because our time is running out. No other questions from, from our participants. So to wrap up, um, what would you be your, your tips in a way, or maybe probably even from some of the experiences you've had with artists who may be kind of resistant to technology? And you, you, you mentioned in one of your, your examples, kind of, you know, someone gives you, is, is the canvas artist and you, 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 you're the, the digital artist. Um, yeah. how, how do you see this in terms of, is there, is there increasing resistance to this? And how do you bring the symbiosis closer together? Back to your distance. Well, I, I, I have to say, I'm, I'm finding it incredibly easy to persuade um, uh, what I call analog artists, uh, older artists, <laughs> or old stuff. I'm, I'm finding it really easy to persuade um, some amazing people to come on the journey with me. Um, I started out only exclusively working with Scarlett, um, but now I've got a, a range of other people that I've taught how to effectively create the stop motion um, and begin to tell stories themselves. Um, a project that I'm working on at the moment is, is six portraits for the city of Melbourne uh, in Australia. Um, and there we have got fine artists that are successful on the international market. And I, I don't consider myself to be international. I consider myself to be doing quite well nationally. But I'm now, um, having been able to show the work to internationally successful artists, um, all six have said yes. So, so I'm, I'm now teaching a whole new uh, range of people that are more successful than me, um, how, the t how we can work together and create something really exciting. Um, I think I, my message for people is to get out of their comfort zone. You, if you're in your comfort zone and you, you just wanna stay there, that's fine. But if you want to create something meaningful um, that has an impact um, on, on people's lives, I think you have to get out of your comfort zone like I did. It eventually forced me out of a job that I had for 40 years in the music business. I was very, very successful at it. And I faced a choice. What do I want for the rest of my life? I can spend the rest of my life either um, helping push young people to become better singers and more successful, or I can actually have a go at doing something really interesting. And that's the ultimate getting out of your comfort zone. Because the life of an artist is not easy. We all know that. It's hard to make a living it's hard to keep that living consistent but it's been the best thing that I've ever done with my with my life and it's very peculiar to, to be on the receiving end of uh, of other people's advice rather than on the giving end of it which is which is what I normally am but if I'm on the giving end for this conference I'm going to say it again be unique don't don't do what other people do find ways of breaking the mold get out of your comfort zone um, and be excited that's the thing about technology. It keeps me excited. Mark, thank you for your insights. Thanks for sharing these experiences with us uh, on behalf of all the participants. Thank you and have a lovely weekend. Thanks so much. My pleasure. And hope to see Bye. you sometime soon. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye now. Okay, so we're now moving to our first workshop on online sales and market trends. And we should have Anders uh, Peterson with us, uh, the founder of Art Tactic app that Anders is there. Hi, Tony. Um, hi, good evening to you. Um, so um, we're gonna talk about online sales and market trends. And of course, before we even start thinking about sales and market trends, we need to look at how the art market is developing and on an international level. So in this workshop, um, and is actually going to be, be looking at um, a, an in-depth in overview of the current international trends and the developments that are going on in terms of online sales platforms and how technology itself is changing this environment. Anders, over to you. Fantastic. Um, 
I, I'm going to have a, have a little presentation to help me because I think it, um, some of this will actually um, involve a bit of data and a bit of graphs and to try to kind of uh, illustrate some of the some of the trends that uh, that we've been seeing over the last particularly I guess last uh, 18 months. Um, so just to give a little bit of background, so I, uh, I'm Anders Pettersson, I run a company called Our Tactic, and Our Tactic is a uh, market research company that we started actually exactly 20 years ago, so we're celebrating the 20th anniversary this year, um, and I must say, if I look back to the early uh, years of the company and looking at the market at the time and compare it to what we are today, uh, it's it's uh, totally different uh, in all all regards in all all respects. And um, hopefully, what I'll do today is uh, probably look back a little bit, but maybe not going back as much as 20 years, but start to look a little bit about some of the the the, the current trends. Are obviously, link this particularly to uh, I guess to the, the the core of this this conference, uh, which is technology and how it is impacting the art world. Um, I will not talk about it so much as Mark was, I guess, from an artistic point, an artist point of view, but what impact this will have on the infrastructure that supports the art market and uh, whether that the various stakeholders being galleries, auction houses, public institutions, etc. And um, and I guess trying to sort of say, well, what, what's the current situation and, and, and what might the future might look like? Um, so uh, the image that I guess I put up here, I think you know the the realization which was in June last year when Sotheby's launched their first hybrid sales, and you see Oliver Barker here standing on in front of us. You can see four screens below. I think was at least eight screens. Um, was a kind of a bizarre experience of uh, seeing where the art world was prior to the pandemic and what has happened during the pandemic with regards to the migration of the entire art world uh, going online. Um, and this was obviously a, a forced situation um, and, and I think it sort of I guess it exposed how um, vulnerable the art world was to uh, an event like that I guess no one could foresee but also how um, I guess again vulnerable because the art world really hadn't embraced technology uh, compared to many other industries. Um, so looking at this was almost as, as I said, I put it next to a Star Wars uh, kind of, it, it had that feel to it. It was a kind of futuristic view uh, of what a auction world, but not only an auction world, what an art world could potentially migrate to or move to. Um, and I think many actually, what we saw at the time, I think this has now become a model that has been tested uh, even if within uh, a 12 month period has proven successful and I think many of the things that we have seen in the particularly in the you know over the last 12 months 18 months uh, are not um, temporary I think these are uh, uh, probably permanent changes that ultimately is also linked to uh, changes in behavioral aspects that we will look at a little bit later on when it comes to uh, buying and both also selling art online. So let me just um, maybe just take you back a little bit just to kind of look at the, the market as a whole. This is not looking at the entire market, but looking at Christie's and Solovis as sort of the two major auction houses of a period from 2000 to 2020. So this is a 20 year period. And you could see just the, the sort of the general growth of the market from the early 2000s until today. And even if 2020 was um, not as good as previous years, obviously due to the to, to, to the pandemic, um, we can see that the overall size of the market has changed, the composition of the market has changed, uh, the role of contemporary art in this market has become a dominant segment. Um, but it's also interesting to see, as I said, you know, 2020 was a uh, a time where the art would, the first half of 2020 was incredibly difficult because most physical events that uh, the art world relies on, whether it's physical auctions or biannuals or art fairs, uh, had to be postponed, cancelled, obviously because of the uh, restrictions imposed by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic or the, uh, the virus itself. Um, which led to, uh, I would say, almost a kind of a cardiac arrest moment for the art world, particularly the first three months of the uh, of the outbreak. Um, but it was remarkable, uh, and I think that moment, which I showed you with Sotheby's and Oliver Barker standing in front of all these screens, taking bids from different parts of the world, was a was a moment where I think the art world realized we got to do something. Uh, and I must say, regardless of the kind of maybe traditional nature of the art world, uh, the way the art world 
embrace technology in its in, in different forms and obviously within the means that the art world has and resources it has to be able to do so uh, showed an enormous amount of agility and I think um, adaption to the, the different difficult circumstances. Uh, by actually June last year, the art market compared to the same period in 2019 was down roughly 80%. Uh, the final figure came down to about 26%, which showed that how much actually was recouped in that final stage or the final six months of uh, 2020. And part of that was um, due to the online market. And I will show you the next slide, which shows you the sort of exceptional growth that we have seen, particularly uh, during 2020. Prior to that, I mean, the online market has sort of, we, we've been monitoring this through research that we launched in 2013, which is a partnership that we have with Hiscox. Uh, and it's the online art trade report that some of you might have come across. Um, and we've been looking at the market for some, some time, looking both in terms of sales, but obviously consumer behavior. And we're going to show a little bit how that might have changed over that period, but particularly in the last 18 months. Um, but up until the pandemic, the online sales were starting to really uh, taper off in terms of, I would say, growth. Uh, the last growth figure we had in 2019 was 4% down from about 10% the prior, the previous year. We showed that they actually online, the online sales didn't really make much inroads into the sort of traditional art market. And part of that, I think, was linked to the fact that it was seen as slightly secondary. Um, there was not a, a sort of great priority among most stakeholders in the art world when it came to the sales side, it was something that you had to have, but there was not really any strategic, um, I, I would say, sort of vested interest in, 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 in making it a, a dominant or, a, or a, a major part of your, your, your business channel or, or revenue channel. Now, obviously, I, I think, you know, this was also maybe one of the reasons why, you know, the art market was exposed to what happened because these alternative channels were relatively underdeveloped compared to many other industries. Um, but in 2020, we start to see this uh, incredible transformation. It happens initially, I would say, predominantly in the auction business. And you can see here Sotheby's um, basically was more, one of the most agile when it came to actually adapting to this. Uh, and But since then, we can see that actually all the major auction houses has followed suit and, and adopted a very similar model to what uh, Sotheby's did initially. A part of the model was really transforming both um, these major, what we call kind of marquee sales, which are the major seasons in New York, Hong Kong and, and, and London, into a kind of digital spectacle of uh, um, changes in the, I mean, it was kind of, a, I would say, a, a combination of a game show, um, a sports match, uh, combined with some more kind of obviously art related things. It was a competitive dynamics that I, I haven't seen in the art world before, which I think created an enormous amount of excitement. And the fact that many of these auctions were also broadcasted to hundreds of thousands of people watching it live on YouTube. And I think it kind of brought the whole auction spectacle away from the traditional 150 people sitting in a room in Christus and Sotheby's during an evening in May or November to actually be something that anyone in the, anywhere in the world could watch and watch the spectacle of fantastic worlds, you know, works of art being uh, potentially sold for very high prices. Um, and I, I do, you can obviously see, you know, it was not only about the format, but also the amount of frequency of uh, sales that we suddenly start to see. Then the, the number of online sales that was put uh, on a daily basis, many of them highly curated, specific segment around uh, collector interest, uh, rather than have these, you know, 200, 300 lots a day sales, um, uh, which could last hours. Basically, we start to see smaller, 40, 50 um, lots curated sales, which I think, you know, also has changed the dynamic of the auction market. It feels much more like a retail market where every day there's something new, which I think, you know, has engaged new buyers, brought new people in, people that probably never set their foot in the physical auction house are now finding themselves watching, you know, auctions on a weekly basis happening in these, um, in, in these auction houses. And I obviously, I'm just now mentioning three, but I think this is something talking to other auction houses around the world has seen a similar, you know, trend. Um, and the impact of this has been significant. I mean, 2020, and if you look at online only auction sales, so these are um, basically sales where there is only the possibility to bid online. There is no physical auction here. There's no telephone bidding and there's no in-room bidding. Um, 
it, it generated more than a billion in sales, billion dollars in sales in 2020. And that's obviously up from, you can see in 2019, you know, 150, 60 million, uh, a significant growth. And I think in a sense, the market has now established a new threshold. It's not going to go back to where we went in 2019. I think most of the auction businesses and also other uh, businesses within the art world has realized that actually uh, the online is a uh, is here and it's here to stay and we better kind of embrace it or we're probably going to lose uh, you know an opportunity to to grow our business in the future i think at the same time this has put uh, significant challenges to people on an individual level who are in the art market and maybe operated the traditional gallery for the last 30 40 years and they're starting to see how rapidly the market is moving onto the digital um, and feeling maybe that you know this is not the kind of game they want to be part of this is just not uh, that's not where they came into the art world for they were there to build um, a traditional business strong client relationships both with collectors and institutions and the artists and feeling that this whole kind of veneer of, of, of dealing with clients through a sort of digital medium um, takes a lot of the kind of pressure away from uh, working with artists and working with collectors. Um, and I think that I think is a challenge. And I think I wonder in the future whether there, you know, is there a room for people that can only stay digital or sorry, only stay physical and stay in the offline world? And I think there is. I mean, you see in other industries that there always will be niche markets and there will be bespoke, uh, whether it's coffee shops or restaurants, it doesn't need to be a chain, it doesn't need to be, um, whether you will find and garner interest, uh, maybe among more local audience, but I do think uh, many people in the art world that maybe has been there for a while and are questioning themselves saying, is this a market I will, will I want to be part of? Is this an industry development that I, that, that I, that I think is worth actually um, uh, going into? Uh, and, and as a result, we have seen galleries closing after many, many years, um, probably saying, well, this is probably the type of time for me to retire and, and leave this to someone else. But I, I do think this, as I said, this move um, onto the kind of uh, towards the digital that we have seen uh, in 2020 is basically lifting uh, everything up to a new new level, a kind of a new watershed uh, watermark level has been set in the market. And I think we will continue to go from here. Um, the, the volumes itself, I think it's been, uh, you know, speaks speaks for itself in terms of what is actually happening. And obviously part of this has been uh, people have been forced to sell online. Um, there, there has been no other option. The physical, uh, the physical aspect of selling art has been largely uh, dismantled in many parts of the world um, due to the restrictions imposed on on engaging with with, with individuals on a one to one basis. Um, the other thing is, is, if you're looking at pricing. Uh, there was a kind of going, I would say, going belief that you couldn't really sell art, although we had exceptions, but you really sold art between the $5,000 to $10,000. That was the kind of the max, that was the sweet spot. Um, and we see this, if you look at average prices of online um, art and collectibles sold between you know January and August in this period that we look at here in 2019, it was hovering around about six, six, six and a half thousand dollars. Um, but you could see the impact that uh, it, during the same period for last year, uh, everything shifted upwards. And the average was then suddenly around $23,000, uh, which is obviously almost a, three, a tripling of uh, the value in terms of average price of works being sold. Now, I think this is a function of two things. One, uh, that the auction houses had no, no other option to that actually, you know, if they wanted to sell higher quality lots, they had to do it online. So they were starting to see higher quality or they're basically introducing higher quality uh, inventory in the, within their auctions. But at the same time, the demand was there. So now the, the confidence, I think, both on the buyer side and on the seller side has increased, which has also lifted uh, the, I, I guess, the, the sort of perceived threshold of what was possible in terms of selling online. And obviously you have seen artwork selling in the millions online these days. So, so, so many of these psychological barriers linked to what is, what can one, what one is willing to, you know, pay for uh, through a sort of digital platform, I think is now uh, evaporating quite fast. That is not to say that there's still a lot of friction when it comes to the kind of digital journey that uh, many people are facing when they are exposed to buying art online. I'm going to discuss that a little bit later on. Uh, but the, I think, as I said, the perceived threshold 
uh, above what is possible, I think is now uh, largely has been broken through. And, we, you know, and this, I think, will be continued to happen as people feel more confident going forward. So what has been the kind of the shorter and long term impact of COVID? And I think, you know, on one hand, we starting to see, uh, you know, I think the art world is starting to adjust to new <clears throat> new type of reality. And uh, I'm just going to have a little bit of water. The um, on the artist side, and I think there's been a sort of a stronger sense of community. And I think, you know, there are um, social media campaigns such as the Artist Support Pledge. Uh, that has generated, I think, uh, you know, the amazing viral effects within the artist community, but also, on the other hand, uh, provided a um, access point for people who maybe felt that artists become too expensive and, you know, you couldn't buy anything if it wasn't uh, thousands or thousands of pounds. And suddenly lowering this amount to basically artworks, of, you know, not necessarily major artworks, we're talking probably by works on paper and prints, etc., but that you could buy for a couple of hundred dollars, a couple of hundred pounds, um, made also this sort of um, this period, particularly from March, I would say, up until you know end of the last year, um, a, a, an opportunity for, for people to engage and feel that they could actually access the art market in an affordable way. And at the same time, the artist obviously benefited hugely from um, from from this particular initiative. And um, and for those of you not familiar with the artist support pledge, it was basically that. Uh, if an artist sold five works, they would pledge to buy another work from another artist. And this had an, a, you know, a significant impact. And many artists that I know managed at least through the first six, seven months of the of the pandemic to actually sustain themselves uh, by using and, 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 and supporting this particular pledge. Um, so that's sort of kind of one thing. The, the, the other thing is obviously this sort of points a little bit to what impact social media is currently having um, as a tool for discovery, as a tool for following artists, as a tool now also for buying art. And we saw in uh, the end of last year, we did a survey among people and, and increasingly, I think it was about a third uh, of people that is now being, you know, following social media has now also purchased a work on, on online using just directly through social media. And many of these things has is linked to the art support pledge, but uh, there's also been basically, um, you know, people DM or direct messaging uh, specific artists about work. So they, they, there's clearly that social media uh, and particularly Instagram has had a, a huge impact on, on the art world. And this is a relatively, obviously, five, six years ago, hardly anyone used Instagram. And, and now it's become a very effective tool for the art world uh, to disseminate information, to uh, build fan base, um, and not only likes, but actually likes are now turning into actually people who, who will buy art directly. And it's interesting that, again, uh, when we asked in 2020, 42% of millennials said that they were influenced by social media by buying art. So it's not simply the channel that you can find things, but they also... I think social media becoming a, uh, a kind of a tastemaker or people within the social media space are becoming tastemakers in, ter in terms of influencing people's decision or what to buy, et cetera. And I think that's obviously a new ingredient uh, in the art world, the traditional tastemakers being collectors or institutions, uh, and not to say that they are still influential in the social media space, but they are being complemented by other types. So, um, uh, other types of tastemakers that I think, you know, ultimately can could change some of the dynamic in the art world going forward. The other thing I think with galleries, uh, a, again, many has, has been faced by, you know, uh, hardship during this period with uh, tough in terms of economically being left with uh, spaces that are ultimately you know, having to pay rent, even if they might have got some uh, rent relief during this, this period, but are still often left with a, uh, a physical infrastructure that is costly to maintain. Uh, at the same time, have had no opportunity to exhibit in any physical art fair over the last uh, over the last 12 to 18 months. Now, this is hopefully coming back. There's already been a couple of art fairs uh, taking place in a physical form, but and hopefully the autumn uh, will start to open up. But what is interesting and i think is again comes back to this sort of slightly collaborative behavior that many of the top galleries many of the the uh blue chip galleries like david schwerner and house and worth and gogosian and others uh there's also been a sort of sense that they realized that unless we help the smaller galleries 
uh, by offering our digital platforms that they had obviously invested in and maybe galleries that didn't have the, the, the infrastructure, the capacity or, or money to build their own, uh, has offered their own platforms to, to help and uh, support uh, many of these younger galleries. So for example, Platform London was an initiative by David Schwerner, uh, which invited different galleries in London to use their digital platform to then engage with buyers and both you know with their clients, but also obviously their own clients. So I think these are initiatives that maybe uh, in the past there's been sort of a sort of a feeling of, of, of rivalry between the, the different galleries in the art world but i think going forward we probably will see much more of a collaborative approach um and, and particularly maybe between the higher end of the market and the lower end of the market because uh, without the smaller galleries without those galleries that incubates and helps and nurture the artists at the early stage well, there will be no generation of new artists. So I think, you know, there's within that sector, there's a, there's, there's a real change. And I think uh, galleries are obviously also responding to this by uh, participating in, in as many, I guess, art, online art fairs, or we can come back to that a little bit. Uh, but they also, I think, you know, realizing the value of, of third party platforms such as Artsy and others uh, in terms of engaging and finding new buyers. Um, if we go to the kind of the art fair side, I think you know the art fair model is probably where this it's the, been maybe the trickiest to kind of I, I would say um, adopt to this new new situation. Um, that is not to say they haven't done anything. I think you know virtually every single art fair has gone online and uh, you know the different versions of it, but these these kind of online viewing rooms uh, model. Um, I think it's very hard to replicate the kind of atmosphere and art fair without necessarily being, becoming almost just another website. Um, and uh, I guess art fairs are more than just um, the thing of looking at art. It's the whole social uh, element of networking, rumors, share, sharing, um, you know, meeting people. It's the it's, it's the same thing, I guess, as a music festival. Uh, to, to listen to something online is not the same as being in a music festival. You want to be with people. It's the social aspect, I think, which has been stripped away from the art fair model. And it's incredibly hard to recreate that atmosphere uh, in the digital space, at least, at least as it is now. But I, so I think for the art fair model, at least as it is in a sort of, in an online sphere, would need to do something to kind of create uh, more excitement. Maybe uh, it's elements like the auction, which is more time sensitive, that you need to do something with it. You need to make a decision relatively quickly. Uh, we could potentially see galleries um, adopting elements like we see in the kind of uh, other collectible space like sneakers, which drops. You have a, a you know time limit, time limited drop. Same thing as you see in the NFT space. Um, that that might sort of entice people to make decisions quicker. The other thing is obviously maybe starting to think about you know virtual reality, uh, more game-like features that kind of go give it more an experience led. But I think it's still hard to replicate that that social element, that that human element, which I think is so important part of the the art fair model. Um, auctions we already kind of talked a little bit about initially, but I think those. Those are, I would say, the commercial entities, at least within within the art world, that has been uh, agile and has been adapted particularly quickly, particularly the top auction house. And that's partly related to, you know, the, the financial resources these companies had. But if you took Sotheby's, uh, it felt like that, you know, a lot of the things that they that happened in March uh, was already uh, in place. It was already there. And it was almost like a switch that was just, uh, you know, pushed and then basically everything fell into place. So, I think the the strategic direction that many of the top auction houses are taking is clearly that digital will will form a very significant part of that. And I think you know the new ownership of of, uh, of, of Sotheby's with, through Patrick Drahi uh, has definitely been an impetus in terms of the direction this auction house is taking. So what is happening on the on, on the buyer side? I mean, I think uh, on on the on the buyer side, we 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 we're looking at different things when we talk to buyers. We're trying to figure out why people are buying, what is it driving them, and and again, you know, not unsurprisingly, I think most people are buying art because there is some element of passion. Otherwise, they probably would buy something else. Uh, but it's interesting in 2020, uh, the, the second highest motivations was um, kind of the sense of the, the social impact, the support, the patronage, the, the fact that uh, people felt that by buying art, they supported artists or arts organizations. Um, and I think this is uh, this might be temporary. It might be something that is linked to the pandemic and people knew that, OK, all these artists will be struggling. So if I buy an artwork, I will satisfy my, my passion for art and ownership of art. But at the same time, it will help someone. 
But I do think there's something actually more profound than this because we uh, have been looking at the space of philanthropy and art and philanthropy for a number of years now. And we're starting to see that the motivation of, of, of patronage in a sense of not only looking at the uh, personal consumption and personal gratification, but actually what impact it can have to support art uh, is becoming an increasingly important element. Uh, the third element is value and value potential, uh, where they sort of kind of return on your investment. And I think, again, this is a dynamic that uh, one shouldn't ignore. Not everyone's going to be in the art world purely for passion reason. I think people, when you pay, even if it's a few hundred dollars, hope that maybe these artists, you know, at some point in the future can maybe have some success and maybe that turns into also some financial benefit. Um, and I think, again, when we think about, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about later on, you know, pricing and transparency, etc., is that people do care about value and they care about why, first of all, you know, why am I paying what I'm paying for to understand the function of pricing in the art world. I think it's important and it's particularly important if you don't know the art world and you don't know what the factors are that ultimately influence price. So there's a fair amount of education that needs to be, I think you need to kind of go into this process in terms of reducing some of the frictions that currently exist for why people might not be involved. Um, and that plays again back, as I said, to, to, to this third motivation, which is around the value potential to, to understand that, you know, not everyone is going to necessarily going to make it as, a, as financially successful as artists. Uh, but, but to have this understanding, I think it is, is, is very important. Now, when we, uh, when we ask kind of attributes and we ask again the younger generation of millennials, um, you know, what is the kind of the deciding factors um, when, when you buy art? And I think, you know, there's, there is quality comes high and quality, obviously, it's, it's a sort of feeling that um, not, not, it's feeling that I guess is that you can buy what you buy online should be the same as you buy offline. I think this is, this sounds maybe obvious, but up until very recently, um, it was a kind of almost perception that the, what's, what was selling online was the kind of the, the minor stuff, the smaller stuff, the things that didn't really fit into an exhibition or didn't fit into an auction, but uh, could easily be sold online. It was partly linked to price points, uh, lower price points, but I think now there's a change. I, I think most people are viewing uh, the, the digital element as a sort of an, 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 an omni-channel, you know, kind of what we call omni-channel experience in the sense that people want to choose. If I buy an electronic, uh, take an iPhone, if I buy it in through Amazon or I buy it through Apple, I do expect the same quality of the product. There's, there shouldn't be any difference. They, I don't go to Amazon because it's, um, because it's a worse or cheaper product, maybe cheaper or maybe more quicker delivery or whatever. But that, that means that in terms of quality, the perception should be this the quality should be the same and that also i think was what we're now starting to see particularly in the auction market and also among galleries that what is presented online is exactly the same as offline and i think that 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 that's clearly key price transparency is probably the second important factor uh, and I think this is still a, an issue in the art world uh, with regards to you know how, how even posting prices. I mean, there's still um, art fairs, there's still places online where you have to do price on request. Uh, for most people, that's just one click too far. Um, if you don't have prices, people would just go on to the next. Um, and I think this is this is changing. And I think this has again been triggered by the COVID-19 and, and, and the period we've gone through, is that the online art fairs has forced galleries basically to put either concrete prices or at least some price ranges to kind of give people some guidance of am I looking at the one million painting or am I looking at something costing you know $250 uh, and I think that's important that's the way we as consumers now um, uh, navigate the kind of retail space in in e-commerce world we we want to know what something costs before we even want to request so if a, a price on request leaves that uncertainty that you might be requesting the price of something that is way out of your league um, so um, and the other things I think, you know, that it, it's the reputation side, I think it's important. Um, reputation, obviously, is, is, is building trust among collectors uh, and, and buyers. Um, and it might, you know, and, and I think it's one of the reasons why the major auction houses has done particularly well, because these are many entities that has been around for hundreds of years and people know who, who, who's a Christie's and who's a Sotheby's and who's a Phillips and Bonhams and, and many others. Uh, but often much harder for galleries to 
to they, 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 they will probably have a, a reputation obviously within their client group and known within the art world but often not known that well known um for people outside and and how do you communicate that reputation how do you communicate your brand how you communicate your trust i think that still is a challenge and that will remain a challenge uh, going forward um I just kind of pointed out this sort of this this millennials and sort of this thing of freshness and this something we came out that you know that quite a fifty percent of millennials wanted things to be fresh, wanted to see something new. Uh, I mean, it's, it's it's a little bit when you go onto a, a gallery's website, you know, they basically you see the same works. Uh, you know, if it's an exhibition that runs over a month, you will see that 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 page will be pretty much static for that month. I think there is a going forward is also how do we engage buyers to come back again and again and to have these sort of elements of surprise that you discover something I think is going to be usually important in the way that 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 the commercial sector is presenting art to their audiences I and mean, this is a little bit back coming back to uh, Sotheby's and Christie's and Phillips and the way they do their sales there's always every day there's something new another sale another type of collectible another type of uh, you know theme etc and that 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 makes people come back and ultimately hopefully will cultivate a new type of um, collector base um, now there are obviously also reasons why people do not buy online. I think you know the main fear that people have, or the, the main worry they have, is that they don't have that sort of aspect of physical inspection. Um, and I, I think you know this is this is uh, obviously for people. As I said, this is a survey among people that hasn't bought, and the, the reason is is not being able to see it in 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 in, in, in its physical form. I think for most people that has for once broken through that barrier. Uh, and have done a purchase online. I think that that physical, that that element of physical inspection, lack of physical inspection, kind of disappears quite quickly. Uh, there's also the technology has improved vastly over the years in terms of uh, whether it's image resolutions and high resolutions or being able to visualize the artwork in a kind of a setting and a context so you could see the size dimension versus a person standing in a room. You could put it on the wall. I think you know technology like augmented reality will play an important part in for people to visualize how things looks like in their own um, in their own environment. Uh, so this, I, I believe, this particular point will be broken down uh, quite quickly as soon as people engage. But we need to get them above that threshold, and I think technology will play a huge part in that it, as it becomes more common uh, in in other in other parts of retail experiences, for example. Um, you know, condition, quality of provenance, all these things are, uh, you know, I think condition is obviously linked to the physical aspect that you don't, you can't physically see it. Uh, but there again, there are technologies out there. There are companies like Articheck, for example, uh, who deals with, you know, digital reporting, condition reporting. I think in the future, this information will be stored with the artwork. This information will follow the artwork. This information will be easily available to consumers when they buy art. And I think more and more platforms Forms are now including condition information of artworks, so people at least have an idea of um, of, of what it is. Um, now, one other aspect is kind of things like returns policy, which which is a pretty common thing in uh, in in most retail businesses. And obviously, by law in the EU, you will have to kind of you have a thirty day, I think it's thirty day or maybe it's fifteen day uh, grace period um, where you can return it without no questions asked. I think this obviously the thing of returning artworks is not a common thing to do. Um, but I also see now that some of the platforms that are actually offering returns policy for art and they might have embedding this kind of potential cost into the pricing of the artwork has managed to actually garner more interest from consumers even if, and actually haven't seen more returns. They haven't actually seen more returns coming coming back in or as a re, as the result of offering a, a, a you know a more favorable returns policy, which actually includes in many cases free shipping. Um, so so these it comes back to these kind of points of, of of creating a less friction. How do we how do we make this journey better? How do we make it um, uh, easier for people? To, to, to feel that actually this, this transaction ultimately, you know, every single step, there's a sense of trust, there's a sense of comfort uh, that I think, you know, and, and as soon as we can start to break down some of these, as soon as we can be better at addressing this, and I must say every single point on this list is being addressed by uh, different different companies, different technologies uh, and, and, and different stakeholders that, that are actually working on and I think it's just a question of time before the industry realizes and this is as a result of the increasing focus on on online sales 
that these things will happen. And, I, and, and the amount of change I've seen in 18 months uh, supersedes anything that I've seen in the last five years. So if this pace continues, I think many of these worries will ultimately be addressed and hence uh, obviously paves the way for potentially a marketplace that will be much larger than it is today. So the more new bars we can get in, the more engagement we can get, the commercial market will grow and any other, I think, stakeholder within the art market, including the artists and institutions, et cetera, will, will benefit from this. Um, so this is, as I said, this kind of this, this thing of creating a, a, a frictionless or less, less friction in the customer journey is incredibly important. And it starts really from the beginning. You know, you are visiting something. How can I trust? How can I trust that platform? And how can I trust the sellers of the platform? Um, in, the, in a traditional, if you went on Amazon or if you went onto eBay, uh, obviously um, ratings and customer reviews are ex, you know, ex incredibly important. Um, the art world has been very reluctant to uh, accept customer reviews um, or to use that as a sort of a, a sales tool on that. And I think you maybe rightly so. I think you know the expectations maybe among the traditional online consumer, maybe of other types of consumer goods, uh, have very high expectations of uh, what they expect from a platform in terms of everything from the transaction itself to the fulfillment. Um, and I think at the moment, the friction within the art world, um, it's, it's partly at the, at, the, at, the, at the experience of until you end up in the sort of um, checkout uh, and, and payment side, you also feel, you know, there's, an, there's, an, there's a hurdle when it comes to the fulfillment side and you know things like logistics and shipping and the cost uh, are uh, obstacles to 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 kind of create as I said a, a smooth uh, experience and part of this I think is is also managing expectations is managing uh, its customer service ensuring that the client and knows that this is not going to take two days. It's not going to be an Amazon Prime where you're going to have it in 24 hours. It will take time, but it's obviously to be able to, um, for the client to know where the artwork might be in the process. And again, technology probably will end very soon, will be able to uh, communicate with clients more effectively when it comes to, instead of sitting there, where is it? And wondering where everything is, you will have a way to do this. And as, as I said, this is already happening. In most logistic businesses already. Um, so the, the, the trust aspect, I think uh, we will see, uh, it's almost like the art world, we need to kind of build up their own way of exhibited or exhibiting trust. You know, how do they portray trust? How do they communicate trust to, to sellers? Uh, because I'm not sure if the sort of customer review uh, model is the right one, um, because you only need two or three negative reviews because virtually potentially could tarnish the reputation of the seller uh, based on someone who you know, may or may rightly so be, be angry or, or dissatisfied with the service that's provided. But I think the art world will need to kind of figure out uh, what's the best way to communicate trust and brand to the ultimate consumer. And I think with then we moving into the more, you know, how do I know the work is what it looks like? And I think what is the, you know, history? What is the provenance? Uh, and this, you know, this information is maybe has been lacking up till now, but I'm already starting to see uh, among uh, most of the kind of major platforms that this thing, the, the, I guess the gravity or, or, or the, uh, the amount of information now provided, it's significantly better than it was even, you know, uh, a year ago. And I think, you know, everyone is responding to these challenges. Um, as I also said, technology is now allowing us to have a better representation of an artwork without seeing it in the physical form uh, through, uh, as I said, high, high resolutions of images or whether it's augmented reality or whether it's these visualization tools that is now becoming very common. Uh, when it comes to transaction, I think, you know, there's, there's a couple of things. Um, you know, the return policies, as I mentioned, that's, uh, you know, what is that? Is it a favorable or unfavorable? I think at the moment there's a tendency that for those who by law has to uh, give people the option to, to return artworks, they will have another clause saying that you will have to pay for the shipping, which is um, sometimes uh, a deterrent, obviously, for most people, which means that they're not going to um, return it. But at the same time, it also might be a deterrent for people to even want to buy it in the first place. And most consumer research in e-commerce when it comes to return policy is the second thing that people look at. They first look at the price and then they look at the return policy. And I think, you know, again, I think the art world might say, 
well, let's let's make it easy. Let's make it easy for them to do. We might have to uh, add the shipping cost to the price in some way or bake it into in another way, because I think ultimately people will will not be it will not be like um, selling you know clothing. People will not return it in the same way as trying a, a pair of jeans and it doesn't fit and you send send it back again. Uh, this is a more you know this is a more passion. Uh, you know it's 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 a, it's a deeper and a more profound purchase. It requires more time, more thinking, uh, and as the the, the tools I mentioned in the point two there, if we can get a better sense of what it is, have the right information, I think we will see you know, that that cost will probably be limited. But by offering the opportunity, I think again, you break down some of these barriers. And the other things like, can you pay by installment? I mean, this whole in, the thing of paying an installment is not an, uh, this is a very, really, you know, it's a common thing to do uh, in many galleries who will offer their clients installment. Um, but also now we're starting to see uh, payment providers like uh, Clara, we have Onarte in the UK uh, that offers repayment uh, options. And then, you know, whether you buy a fridge or you buy an artwork, uh, not everyone would like to kind of fork out everything up front, but would like to see that being spread out over, you know, a 10 month period, 12 month period. Um, so it's, uh, I, I think there's simple, small things that each together will start to make this uh, market potentially, you know, much, much bigger. Um, and the other thing is like, you know, is it safe and, you know, all these things with, with uh, cybercrime and cybersecurity, all these things, I think, you know, again, the, you know, this is something we're facing now day to day uh, in any, in any kind of setting or commerce. Um, and I think there will, there's no difference here between with art world and any other consumer goods. Uh, I jumped actually pricing and valuation, which is true that come before, but the pricing and valuation, I think I'll, I'll come back to that. I take one step back and pricing and valuation, um, I think it's really a, a, a very, very, very important. Uh, it's typically the one of the first thing after obviously having, having discovered the artwork, you want to know the price and you want to know some sense of value. You know, am I paying a fair price? Is this is this in line with um, with what I what I see out there? Um, and I think most people has you know prior to I would say the last two years there was a lot of price in transparency uh, or non transparency. Uh, there were a lot of price on requests. Uh, I think that that is just a kind of no go uh, in in the commerce world if you want to create again a smooth experience and and engage more buyers. I think signaling upfront obviously was something cost and I think most research and I think Artsy did something about. Uh, 12 months ago, where they show there's a clear correlation between price transparency and interest and, and sales, ultimately. Um, now, price is one thing. So one thing is obviously to tell someone what something is worth. The second thing is that how do I know that is a good price or a fair price? Uh, and I think we will start to see more uh, pricing tools uh, being offered in the art world, uh, maybe through the platforms themselves or third party providers. And we're already starting to see um, applications and software and using a mix of art artificial intelligence and other things to start to create an automatic kind of pricing pricing mechanism or pricing models uh, that I think will be pretty common going forward. This is not necessarily used for pricing a 35 million Picasso, but can be work really well for maybe the lower end of the market where there's still, it's quite difficult. You need a subscription to maybe one of the databases that to, to find a price. I mean, this should really be part of the journey. It should be there. It should be easy. It's just be one click and you should see what are similar works priced for. And then we're starting to see an inkling of it because typically, um, sellers would uh, introduce an artist and say, this is the price of the artist, here's the artist, and by the way, here are some other artists within the same category. And that obviously by looking at their prices, you can say, okay, this is more or less within its, uh, within its range. Um, the final thing um, I wanted to kind of mention is just fulfillment, um, which I already talked about, which was this whole thing about, you know, the shipping, the logistics, uh, which is tricky. Uh, it's tricky because the art world uh, and the logistics providers and the cost of shipping and the, you know, we're not simply talking about putting something in a FedEx packet and, and hope that it will arrive. I mean, these are highly often fragile goods and have to be taken, you know, care of. And I think there is a, a still, um, a, you know, a fragmentation also within the logistics business, which is, makes it difficult to make a, a global market where artwork can travel freely. There's duties, there's tax regimes, all these things kind of, you know, weighs in on it. Um, but I, I believe, again, uh, there are companies that are already looking at fulfilling these things. Um, so my final two things is uh, coming to um, as ownership. Uh, I think there is a there's a new sense of uh, we talk very much about buying art online and 
and, and I guess sort of selling art online and the, the structures around how people do this and how the different stakeholders has changed as a result of the COVID. But, but there's also new ownership models now. And, and I, I heard just briefly, I came into the talk and, and Mark mentioned, uh, or Tony asked about NFTs. So there was a question about NFTs. Um, and I think, you know, we're also now experiencing new formal ownership um, that uh, not everyone wants to own the physical object in its, in its, in its physical form. Uh, so we're starting to see the emergence of fractional ownership models, uh, and this is not linked to the blockchain, it's not linked to NFTs, but um, Otis, for example, and there's another company out there called Masterworks, uh, is really about uh, more, I would say, from a kind of maybe an investment point of view to say, how can I uh, be part of this, this um, growth in the art market and the value that's being created? Um, up until now, it's obviously you will have a need an enormous amount of wealth to actually be part of it. Uh, but what they have allowed to is kind of an, what we would sort of define as a democratization of art investment. It's a it's an opportunity to be a so-called shareholder or part owner of the cultural asset um, through different types of platforms. So Otis, Masterworks, all these things are are, are new engagement models. Uh, that is not necessarily to the likings of everyone. Not everyone's going to be an art investor, but for a young, uh, young in this case with artists, which is r largely collectibles, we're starting to see as a sort of a migration. And I sometimes I road test these ideas with my 15 year old son to see, you know, would you done that? And they say, yeah, definitely. Even if I had would have no interest in it. And I think this is this is a sort of again a sign that people are also um, accessing the art and collectibles market sometimes from a, you know, a different door they're just coming in through something else maybe by actually engaging with something like a frank fractional ownership model and invest 10 pounds in a pair of 1985 air jordan ones um will lead you to maybe be a, ultimately a collector of air you know uh, air jordan ones in, in in the future um i think some of these things act as educational tools they act as a um a, a gateway to a new type of community a new type of buyer a new type of audience that also i think also the art world should be open to and in order to do that you need to adopt your model you need to change the way you necessarily engage with your current audience to try to find out how do i get them in how do i lead them into this market and i think already you could start to see some some models around that and the same thing i think you know with nfts and i, I know the discussion with uh, tony and mark was about I, I guess from an artistic point of view from a infrastructure point of view and an audience point of view i think nfts is open up again uh, whether nfts is the end game or this is just the beginning of something totally different um, i think it's it's open up the opportunity for the art world to realize there is an enormous amount of people out there who's interested in collectibles in this case digital collectibles but i think these things these two worlds will start to merge um, that unless we start to tap into it unless we start to um to 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 uh, to, to create relationships within these two worlds we will miss out uh, already we see the gaming world we see the sports world, we see everyone engaging with it. And, it, and it's, it's a way, again, to cultivate a fan base, build a fan base and make it bigger. And I think that's my kind of, I, I want to end it here. We just want to leave, we have like 10 minutes of questions. And I'm, I'm happy, Tony, I think you might be the one who will feel them uh, if there are any questions. But I'll, I'll stop there um, as uh, so we don't run out and I'll uh, just stop sharing and then I'll see if there are any questions. Oh, wow. Thank you so much, Anders, for this perspective and the knowledge and data you've presented to us. Sorry, it was, it was dense, but... Um... but it, 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 was, it was fascinating to see a complete different side. And, and, and perhaps before I open up my, my, the floor to questions, just, you know, in, we have artists with us, we have gallery owners with us, but in your conversation with artists, you know, when when you're talking about the market, um, where do you find yourself in this environment with artists? Is it, is it a comfortable space to be in? Is, is, is there more resistance by or less resistance as time goes by with younger artists, for example? Yeah, I mean, I, I said, so I'm, so I guess from a background, I, I, I come from the kind of market side. So I don't come from the creative side. I think, you know, my, my background started in banking and I, uh, that's my comfort zone. Um, I do think, <clears throat> so when I think about the market, it's not necessarily, it's never been necessarily the commercial aspect, um, you know, buying and selling and investing, although my last example is kind of tilting that way. Um, 
the, the market for me is the, is, is the infrastructure, is the ecosystem, including the artists and everyone involved in it, you know, it, from curators to public sector to whatever it is. Um, we all form part of it. The, the, the market for me is, um, although it has aspects which I think are troublesome, uh, I think it has a market, it has there's certain, you know, I, I guess issues in terms of the inequities that the market is creating uh, that I think is troublesome. Um, I do think without the market, there is no um, there is no opportunity to create infrastructure of supporting the artist. So I think you know these things has to, they, they are there are I think you mentioned the well symbiotic. You know, they, in a sense, they are they are part of the same thing. I don't see them as different. Some of the conversations when I when I talk to artists about market is so not so much about you know buying and selling, but it's it's more about models, you know, how do we, how do you as an artist engage with this world that you might not like that much? You might not like what's on happening on the surface, but by ignoring it, uh, you're not doing yourself a favor. Now, I think the question is whether you want to engage with it by working with the art world or whether you want to find other models to in interact with the market. And I think currently what's really exciting is that I think creatives have found other models. They may be in a simple sense, people have, have, have gone to Instagram to help and build their own fan base and selling maybe directly. We see through the NFT space that artists has found another way to market without any intermediaries. Um, so I think technology in a sense for me has become a liberating factor that um, the mark, which the market has to respond to. I, I mean, the traditional art market, whether you're a gallery or an auction house will have to respond to these changes because otherwise you will find yourself with, with no role in this uh, because everyone's going somewhere else. And I do think there's a role for intermediaries. I do think there is a role for nurturing. I think there's a role for expertise. I think there's a role for historians and curators and artists. Everyone has a role, but the role might have changed or the role might be about to change. And it's almost for all of us to kind of figure out what role am I going to play in the next 10 years? Uh, and I think even for us as researchers, a lot of the themes we were looking at I feel is irrelevant now and I, I, or I feel is less relevant and I need to put my focus towards what does research and information and data in my world mean for the future and I think we probably all need to, to start to ask those questions because otherwise if we're starting to become irrelevant then I think we, the clock is ticking before we might find ourselves um, irrelevant probably. Indeed. We have actually a question linked to a particular model um, galleries. And the question, uh, and I'll read this, is do you believe that the gallery model is successful and sustainable? You know, we've seen galleries, especially even smaller galleries, shut down because of COVID. Um, do you think we can have the more emergence of these physical galleries or is it going to be a rather radical shift towards online galleries? I think, I think we'll... Um... I think that this, this market probably will be tiered. Um, I think there will be galleries that will always exist in its, in its current form and might be even become bigger. Um, I think the economical cost, and I think again, the COVID-19 has uh, proved that uh, sitting with a physical space, um, that maybe was important because that was the way you could uh, you know, curate and you could have a program uh, around your artists. It made it facilitated it easier to to exhibit and and and, and promote and help your artists. Um, but I guess the galleries has never had it hasn't been a retail business in terms of footfall and people coming in. Um, I think the the um, the drag during this period obviously has been the cost associated with having a physical space, not being able to have exhibitions, uh, the the fact that most art fairs were not possible to operate in its current form. I think it's pretty, you know, huge economic pressures on galleries to also again rethink whether the gallery model in its current state is the same. That does not mean that space will 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 disappear. I think you know we have to see art not only online. I think that the physical aspect will remain. Those two I think will be hybrid. But it's whether the existing gallery model as it is um, is here to stay. And I think some will and the most powerful will probably have the means to kind of keep that going. Others might will have to change. And I think the change might be their models like uh, here in London, we have a um, a place called Cromwell Place, which is a almost a kind of a 
a co-working, co-collaborating, co-exhibiting model where you have office space and you have shared uh, space uh, of exhibitions that you can book yourself in. And you could almost see this sort of a uh, we work model. I mean, I'm not sure if they're going that way, but you could see this being potentially in multiple locations around the world. And if you were a member of this, you had your office in London, but you could then create an exhibition in, in Hong Kong, but you didn't necessarily need to do this every single month. You could do it three times a year. Uh, so I think the model will become more flexible. I think this thing of being almost um, forced to have, I guess, by the art market, almost like forced to have a physical space by almost like the reputational impact of not having it, that you're not seen as serious. This is a little bit the same as 10 years ago, if you didn't have an office, people would say, oh, what kind of company are you? I mean, that's not taken. Now it's almost the opposite. If you have an office, people will say, why do you have an office? Um, so I do, I do think this is changing. I think the other thing is that the model of a gallery or the role of a gallery as an agent for the artist might change in the sense that the role of simply working with an artist in its, you know, in, in within its physical nature of, um, you know, in, in, in a traditional form of working with collectors and museums and exhibiting and program is probably also need to change because if this digital area grows, you almost need someone to be able to handle that space as well. And building reputation in the online world and the digital world is a different thing. And I think, the agent might become a more kind of holistic uh, relationship manager of an artist, which, and we already start to see some galleries closing down or, or, or and, and becoming represent or agents of an artist. Uh, basically every aspect of the artist, whether it's in the public, commercial, online, digital. Uh, and I think that's also a uh, potentially a, 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 a a move that we might see among some galleries taking that route, uh, which, which is, I think it's a consequence of some of the changes we see. We have another question. Um, and as I saw that you've created a report on NFTs, from the report, what is the most exciting find that you can share? Um, so, so this report was basically, uh, we started to look at NFTs in December last year, where we thought, okay, what is quite interesting, what's happening, what, what is this? And it was partly linked to um, some work we've done around the sort of digital space and the impact of that, that blockchain could have on the, you know, the art, art world and the art economy, et cetera. And we started, it led us to NFTs. So we were pretty late in the game. I was not a native NFT buyer early on, and I wish probably I was, but I, I wasn't. Uh, I came to it quite late, but we started to take a strategic decision that let, let's do something here because uh, I don't know where this is going. And I, um, so we started looking at the research. We started collecting data. Um, we thought in February, let's go ahead with a report. And we were a bit late. So by end of this, um, end, of, end of March, we sort of thought, okay, let's get it out. Suddenly people sold for 69 million and we realized, God, this is what's happening now. Everything shot up. Uh, we had to delay the report because we realized what we had initially said was now totally out of, um, you know, out of context. It had no relevance to really what was happening at the time. I think what has allowed us to think a little bit about, I mean, I think the, the, the finding of the report is much more, I would say, we looked at a specific platform in this case. We'd studied Nifty Gateway, which was the sort of account for about 74% of the sort of NFT transactions, at least at that time, um, was to try to figure out what is happening. And for me, it was... Um, I can't sort of point, I mean, we know all the big numbers. We know obviously that the market sort of kind of went up heavily and up in, uh, you know, in March, it sort of fell down in a April and then same thing in May. I think that's kind of was a nat natural evolution of a kind of uh, a boom, not necessarily bust and a, well, we can maybe see a, a decrease in value, but, or in sales, but I think it's left a legacy. Um, I don't think the report necessarily managed to cover that because it was kind of written before this happening. I think now what's interesting uh, I think it's, what does this mean for the world, for the art world going forward? I mean, I was starting to see more artists, more artists from the kind of community that we used to kind of cover, which is more the traditional artists. We see uh, galleries and we see others starting to take a real interest in it. So um, the, the, I guess the, the other thing uh, from the report that, that um, was interesting by studying it is the models of sales. So if I go back to the commercial aspect again is um, when Nifty Gateway opened up these editions, which was not, if you looked at Super Rare and Rarible and many of the others, it was very much a, a unique editions with a, an auction process behind it. Uh, Nifty was kind of, um, I guess, experimenting with the with edition size uh, and allowed a little bit like an editions market in a traditional sense. It gives lower price levels, gives some certainty to what you might want to pay and you becoming one or maybe 20 or 30. And then they open up the open editions, which was 
I think an, an incredible experiment because it was, um, you know, a time limit period was a fixed price. You didn't know if the addition size was going to be 500 or 5,000. Um, for the creator, obviously, this was an enormous uh, pull in in terms of revenue because if you sold 5,000 additions at 500, you know, that, that's a significant amount of money. That model has now been replicated in the real world where Damon Hurst just um, a couple of months ago sold a whole series of um, called the Blossom, uh, Blossom series which was uh, prints, physical prints, but he used exactly the same, to, um, the same process. He basically said, uh, you can buy this print for $3,000 and it's gonna be open for a couple of weeks and by the end, it's set. But I'm not gonna tell you how many editions will, it will be. That will be depending on how much demand. I think the artist, I think he you know, raised 20 million plus uh, as a result of it. So there are more, uh, rather than sort of pinpointing a specific, um, data point i think there are just um lessons to be learned of how um how we can engage and create excitement around uh you know buying and engaging with art and and, and i think there's also lessons learned that you know um what goes up ultimately will come down again but i don't think i don't see it as a sort of disaster moment and end game i think it's actually just a phase one of a something that's going to be much has much more profound impact on the art market going forward and i think we're going to see an increasing uh merging of the, the physical and the and the, the digital in that regard um uh, going so i so, say um uh, i encourage everyone who's obviously interested in the report to go and actually read it but um that's i would say sort of kind of some of the the, the, the keys the key aspects of, of of what we looked at anders thank you ever so much for your thoughts and I'm sure we'd be able to get in touch with you if people have uh, any further questions or anything uh, if Zach would like to read more into the um, the NFTs report um, thank you so much have a lovely weekend Great. we're gonna continue with our debate now and maybe you can also check us out as we go along also on on Facebook in some of these sessions Fantastic. Um, thank you, you Anders. thank you so much um, so now moving swiftly on um, to uh, uh, our panel discussion uh, for our final part uh, of today's session, maybe a little bit shorter so that we can quickly go out and grab a beer uh, for those of you who want to do that. Um, so I'd like to welcome now our panelists for our roundtable on new technologies in the art world. Uh, I see Angela here and Olga here. Good evening to you. Hi, Olga. Hi, everyone. Hi, Tony. Um, Hi. It's lovely to meet you guys. Good evening. Uh, Olga is the founder of Imperia, based in London. Are you physically in London right now? I am physically in London, yes. The team is a little bit all over Europe, but I am in London um, myself. Uh, we at Imperia work with art galleries and artists, and we created a platform um, to curate virtual exhibitions and virtual galleries um, that effectively allows you to display your artwork online, um, embed it into any website, and just showcase, um, yeah, showcase and sell artwork through a virtual, virtual platform. Excellent. Uh, Angelo. Good evening. Hi, good evening. Good evening. Um, welcome to our virtual conversation. Uh, and before I introduce Angela, I'd like to bring back, I, I see Maria here with us, but we've heard a little bit about Maria, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna get back to you soon. Angelo, tell us a little bit about yourself and, um, and also, of course, you're, you're, a, you're an entrepreneur and an AI expert and uh, a founder of companies. So, so tell us a little bit and how it's correlated to, to the art world or can be. Yes, hi. Um, so yes, my background, I have a technical background. So I've started doing AI for quite a number of years, for the last 20 years or so. So uh, I've seen how AI has evolved. And also, I'm an avid art collector myself and also uh, have been uh, you know, doing AI art for the, for many, many years. In fact, much more before it became popular. And uh, so this combination of creativity and science uh, has always been in my nature. 
And uh, it's been really exciting to see more and more people becoming aware of digital art, appreciating it more. It was something that was kind of seen by the wayside. When I was doing AI art, for example, in 2004, um, it was seen as something like a quick hobby, you know, it wasn't taken seriously. Now I think that this is something that um, people are taking seriously and more, you know, appreciating it more. So I think that the world is moving in the right direction. And the long view of 20 years doing something obviously, obviously gives you um, a little bit more insight into what can happen, what can be done, and also where the world is heading. I'm also aware you need to make sure that you're heading into the right direction and please drive carefully as we're I'm not driving always. myself. <laughs> I'm not driving myself. As okay, I good, good. <laughs> and not awesome. autonomous driving either. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Um, so let's kick off our, and I'd like this to be a, an open conversation between us and also our participants. Uh, so, uh, you know, if, if any of the participants uh, would like to um, uh, Flag up any questions, please use the Q&A box we have over here. Um, so as we kick off this conversation, I'd like to, to, to frame um, this, this debate and this, this round table. Um, so of course, we've heard already from, from the interventions we've had today about how new technologies are also radically changing, they, technology itself has radically changed from AI, VR, AR, now NFTs. Um, but my first question to you is, what, what's the benefit of all this from uh, your own worldview and your own experiences? Should, should I go or I'll go, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So, so basically, um, I see that you know with, with NFTs it is kind of the marriage of uh, obviously of of digital art with with the blockchain with the with the with the blockchain concepts of having unique fun, non fungible token, and I feel that it is a very clever way of making something digital appear unique like as if you have you know like this standard kind of more traditional artwork where there is only one artwork or a limited edition, and assigning ownership and also coveting rights towards that artwork and i think that uh, nfts are here to stay um maybe you know like the format is going to change over time as things are optimized this is like in the early days of of blockchain and crypto and as with any new technology things are tried out and then refined so for example you know some of the some of the implementations when it comes to for example ethereum like to mint an nft i think is a little bit too expensive still um We've seen a lot of different marketplaces that are adopting a more artist-friendly approach. I think that the NFT concepts are also going to change a lot the art world. For example, this concept that the artist keeps taking a commission on resale of the artwork. I think this is a brilliant idea. I think it should be implemented also for more traditional um, artwork, actually. And uh, seeing, you know, how, how things work i think this is a very interesting development and uh, hopefully this is going to also affect the way things are done the way that things are done for example on digital auctions and also making digital art more and more acceptable um, recently i have set up um, uh, an institute it's a fresh institute called the creative science and arts institute in which we are promoting in fact the intersection of science creativity and innovation because i believe that um, uh, this you know will get a, i get a lot of scientists who know me also that i have an artistic background and they tell me you know like help me get into this uh, or make my scientific work more visually appealing and also simultaneously um, artists who want to get into this world who for example do not know how a neural networks how they can actually use the tools that are available how to use them so i think this this confluence this also this uh, synergy between both worlds i think is, go is here to stay and is going to produce fantastic stuff that you know the world actually wants and covets and when you look at um, younger people especially nowadays I mean some of them live much more in the virtual world than almost in the real one and uh, you, you know so, I think that owning virtual assets is going to become as important as owning the real ones so I think this is also there will be new 
venues that we do not have currently that is going to become more and more important? Olga. Yeah, I'm going to jump in here and I'm going to probably steer it a bit more towards the general application of technology um, in the art world because I think um, NFT is such a hot topic that everyone's talking about these days, but at the same time, over the past 18 months, we've seen such a wide variety of applications of technology in the art world. And I think it is changing it for the better, making it more accessible for people without necessarily needing to travel. Um, from the perspective of VR and AR, if you think about the kind of traditional gallery model um, and traditional way of exhibiting art, you need to go to a different country to see a show or at maximum it would be a video um, where you wouldn't really be able to feel present within this exhibition, within this art world, um, where what we see now and the real shift that we're observing is uh, people, while keeping their doors open when possible, um, and it is possible in England at the moment, but also uh, really broadening the base of collectors, the base of people that are able to attend a show, whether it's a private opening, a private sale, um, or whether it's just a general overview of a, of a collection online or a showcase of a particular artwork. Um, so that's what we're really seeing in terms of shift um, of things with VR. And what we also saw is artists creating their own um, artistic worlds, which is a sort of way of presentation your artwork um, kind of outside the traditional means of galleries where it is a four white walls and a concrete floor, which is brilliant, but at the same time, with all the creativity available and possible, I think what technology really enables is kind of furthering the self-expression there uh, and really creating this world and presenting yourself online and digitally um, somewhere outside the remits of what's, what's possible physically. Maria, I would like you to perhaps reflect even from your own personal experience or professional experience in terms of this relationship with, with technology. I don't know why I refer to it as like a relationship, but you know, relationships also are with human beings, um, but <laughs> that's for another conversation. Um, how, how have these technologies even changed your own practice, the way even the, the past years now, the, the projects you've done and, and uh, tell us a bit more about that. For me, I mean, I started this exploration and new technologies and new ways on how we can connect and reach new audiences to technology and online two years ago. And it was all new for me and it was all very scary. So, and that's one of the main reasons why we created this event. Um, but as I went along, it, it started becoming a bit of, um, something that I had to become part of what I do in parallel and not sh shift completely because as Anders said, and as I said before, I still believe that there should be, uh, it, art and science should work together and not choose one over the other. Um, I also had the pleasure to work with Olga this year where we launched a VR exhibition and we had submissions from South Korea, from Thailand, from it was beautiful because we could reach such a broader audience and we brought them together in a virtual space. Um, so I think that how I look at technology is not uh, for me um, a shift. This is very important. I see it as a tool um, which we should embrace and we should explore. Um, the thing is that it's always changing and always evolving. So we need to keep up with, with all these changes and evolvements. Um, with regards to NFTs, again, it's giving artists a new platform also of sustainability at the end of the day. So um, this is another way of how to look at new technologies, um, apart from reaching new audiences giving artists um, tools, and not just artists, even the infrastructure, the industry, the market, new tools of how they can sustain their practice and their profession. We were talking about the artists here, and, and Anders in, in his intervention also looked at the, the audience, but let's delve into the, the viewers, the buyers, the expe those experiencing it. What value added does it give to them? 
access. Access. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> I'll completely agree with Maria here. It is, uh, yeah, it's access. It's uh, not needing to uh, travel thousands of miles to see an exhibition you want to see. But also from a collector perspective, things like AR and something we've done quite a lot um, in the past year is being able to preview the artwork in your own space. Because it's often so difficult to think, especially if you're trying to look at things online, you know, yeah, it's one meters by two meters, but then who can, who actually knows how big is that? Do you know if it's going to fit into your, into your living room? And same kind of thing happens um, from a physical experience perspective, because yeah, you see the artwork in the gallery. Um, maybe you want to see how it's going to fit into your space, but you have no clue unless you, you bring it there. Um, so that's what things like AR allow you to do effectively. Just try it in your living room, see what it's going to look like on your wall, see what you're going to feel like um, living with that piece. So I think, yeah, it's definitely in terms of accessibility, broadening the base um, and also making your online experience a lot more engaging and interesting because um, even if you want to visit the physical exhibition, but you want to preview what's happening there before, uh, before you actually go and travel, or I think what we see a lot these days with, with things being closed down, people are so tired of staring at the screen all the time. It's just gets so boring. You just scroll over and over and it's a white page with endless pictures and nothing really makes any impression on you as a viewer. Versus when you see a more immersive experience, something more interesting, um, it just engages you on a different level and you can just share it with your family and have a more interesting experience of being online despite the fact that you can't actually physically attend the place. Mm. And I, I think, yeah, I think that uh, NFTs will also open up new ways of expressing um, uh, cre creativity. For example, by adding music, by adding multimedia experiences to it and videos. So, for example, like uh, there have been a lot of DJs who have been doing uh, NFTs and you get like this unique unique music that you've never actually heard before. So I can envisage, you know, like uh, events in the future where people who own particular NFTs will bring their unique content and uh, only if you know that collector you'll be able to actually listen to that particular um, content or, or see it. Um, I also see that, uh, you know, using digital, uh, you have a bit less of problem, problems in, for example, delivering the artwork. Also, you don't need uh, probably things like condition reports um, uh, on artwork, so you're going to have certain advantages. Um, obviously, I think it will also come with new, unique, uh, you know, um, issues actually of its own. For example, what if the digital format becomes obsolete? Uh, one of my good friends, Mario Klingemann, who has been doing a lot of NFTs recently, um, experienced this, um, in fact, by uh, putting up NFTs uh, for, I think, was one of the first actually, and some of the code in the NFTs actually started We, we lost you there. As the moment you say, it was really happening. Deep. We, we yeah, lost you there like at the moment. Ah, sorry. Um, so, so, so some of the code kind of degrades. So there is also like digital decay in NFTs that we can experience. So I think it, uh, it is a little bit of a, it, it, it will bring about new forms of issues. How do you conserve digital assets? How do you keep them? Um, uh, displayable over a, a number of time and also how do you display them? Um, uh, I, I feel certain technologies like for example having holograms um, uh, and also maybe matching the NFT with some kind of physical artifact is also interesting in itself and I think that yeah we'll have maybe even purpose-built rooms of the future in which you have you know better projection technology in your house that you can actually show off the nfts um to their best uh, to their best um use and also i think ai for example can enhance these can enhance the stuff that you know is being put out now and continue keeping it fresh and relevant so maybe if i buy the nft art now and I have everything in digital artifacts, I can improve the way that it looks like and keep it fresh even, you know, 50 years from now, it will be enhanced and modified and made even better to the technology of that time. Angelo, I'd like you to, to expand a little bit on, on artificial intelligence um, and, and where you see this develop in the future, not, not necessarily related to NFTs, but in general in terms of also in, in the arts. 
Yes, yes, definitely. I think that AI is, uh, is a, first of all, can be a very great assistive tool um, for artists. So I, I was lucky to have created one of the first human AI collaboration systems called UMA, the Universal Machine Artist. And uh, th this has led to a little bit of controversy with, with some people who are telling me, like, you're destroying art. No, this is not art at all. Um, and uh, I had a lot of interesting experiences. For example, how do you put the provenance of that art? Who is the artist in that case? Um, so there are a lot of issues, I think, that will pop up as AI becomes more capable. And I see it that, you know, at the moment, AI is still generating stuff depending on what you've actually trained it for, on. Um, I think that as time goes by, it will become more creative. So we'll be able to have better AI that creates more stuff that is um, original. And, uh, you know, then we come into questions of what is art? What, does the author need to have human emotions? Does the author need to have feeling for the art to be art rather than just, you know, a generation, a random generation of pixels? So I think there will all be these issues. And in fact, this is something that we're exploring at the moment on how do you tie in the human emotions with digital art? How do you actually associate because people do associate certain imagery with certain emotions how do you associate it with them and that is something uh, you know of an upcoming project actually that we're working on um how do you teach ai this kind of stuff i think that it's going to be one of the most difficult things to do um i do think that it is much easier for example to teach an ai how to drive automatically then actually to have an ai create the awesome of art so i think that this is going to be something that's going to create um uh, we're going to explore it for many many decades to come not just years to come i'm curious to, to hear olga's perspective on on this and and maria olga what what are your thoughts I think it's quite interesting of what's going to happen with um, AI art recreation. I think we're still so far from it um, in a sense that perhaps in the next 10 years, we'll have to think about it a bit more. Um, although, who knows, maybe things are closer, closer than we, th they, we think they are. Um, what Angela also said that I found quite interesting is around um, decaying of the technology, because I think going forward, technology of the time will become something you know, like the Renaissance kind of times or um, or the 20th century artwork, which all had characteristics of um, the era, right? So I think the NFTs will have the characteristics technology-wise of the era when they were created, i.e. 2020, um, 2021 and going forward. Um, so I think these perhaps outdated lines of code, which wouldn't run on all the newest devices um, going forward would be probably something that carries the um, idea of the timing when the artwork was actually created and that would be something that is of value um, just because it identifies it with the exact time of creation. Maria. Um, I, I've already had this discussion once with Angelo and uh, I do believe that um, art needs emotion and needs intellectual thoughts and I do believe that. But then in another, in another, from another perspective, I also see the potential of having this AI assistant, for example. Um, and I see that AI can, I mean, there are various ways that AI can Im be implemented in the art world and it already is being implemented in different platforms, uh, not just in the creation of artwork. So, um, um, so I, I believe Artsy have also a Jerome project as well, which uses AI to identify the tastes um, of, an, of, of, of a client and automatically generates those artworks in their searches, for example, if I'm not mistaken. So AI can be used and is being used in different ways. Um, Yes, that's my perspective on, on, on AI. Thanks, Ma. Um, Olga, back, back to you. I'm going to shift a little bit our subject now from AI to, to startups um, and, and tech art stuff, startups. Um, what, what's your, can you, can you tell us a bit your, your experience? Kind of what, what triggered this and, and how are you seeing these kind of the startup environment for uh, 
startups dealing with technology and art or art technology or tech art? <laughs> um, yeah, I think there's definitely been a lot more startups that came out of the, out of the pandemic. Um, we were probably on the earlier side because we started in um, early 2019, uh, kind of before a lot of people came to the scene. It is definitely booming in a sense of, um, yeah, what technology can do with art. I think that's really sprung out of the fact that there was no ways of seeing art physically um, like people are used to do so. Uh, so I think it's definitely moving into that direction of using more technology for art because art is um, an industry that's quite archaic in terms of use of technology in a lot of um, a lot of ways. And while um, things like retail are embracing technology a lot more, it just comes to it now. Uh, so I think there's not, I mean, there's a fairly limited amount of startups around working with art tech because it's also not seen as like the huge venture market, you know, the way uh, people would approach fintech or, or other industries. Um, but it's very interesting nonetheless to be um, part of this kind of technological boom <laughs> in a sense and, and the start of uh, the rise of the art startup in a sense. Um, we've been ourselves in quite a few of accelerators, which were more around immersed technology or retail tech, because we also work with um, retail, um, high-end retail as well. Uh, but yeah, to be honest, there is not so many art-focused startups that we're seeing, uh, are like in all those accelerators and platforms. That maybe you of the art startups. So um, yeah, perhaps there'd be more more platforms to encourage art startups to to appear in the future because I think it's fairly limited these days. Mm. What what gaps are you seeing right now in, in the market for for uh, art tech um, market? Um, hard to say, but I think things like uh, applications for collectors. Uh, for collectors to actually manage their collections, especially when it comes to things like NFTs. And if you have NFTs from different portals, <laughs> then you're kind of stuck between the, the super rare and rareable and you know, all the different platforms where, you're, where you acquire them. And then you have collections of physical artworks and where it all comes together. Um, so I think collection management perhaps could be an interesting, um, interesting area to explore. I'm already seeing Angela here thinking about, oh, here's my next business idea. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, as uh, you know, someone who's been involved a lot in startups and investing in startups, and it's like something close to my heart. Um, I, I think that there is a lot of opportunity, first of all, in creating also tools for artists and uh, also for creatives, getting people to be more creative. For example, you know, I mean, I just uh, recently got the, the iPhone 12, which has a LiDAR scanner inbuilt. I mean, uh, this is quite amazing when you think about it. I mean, I first encountered LiDAR around, I think, 10, 12 years ago, when it was, uh, when the craze of autonomous cars had not even started, but there were already the prototypes that, that were going on. And the LiDAR scanner used to cost in excess of 100,000. I mean, dollars, which, which is crazy now that we actually have this stuff on consumer technology and we don't even think about it much. So we actually have tools that enable us to do AR and scan objects in 3D. And I think that that is going to be something um, uh, pretty new because not everyone, a lot of the AI artists, a lot of the even the NFT creators um, actually have to learn a little bit of code. And, uh, you know, not all artists actually know how to do that. They really struggle to do that. There needs to be that education. Um, yet having a little bit more, you know, not like Instagram filters, but something more advanced that lets you do a pipeline, that lets you create the tools basically that you need in order to express the creativity in a digital way. I think that is very important. And yes, I think that the galleries also, and especially the curation aspect, I don't think is going to go away because a lot of people actually have been asking me, okay, what will be the role of galleries? In this our gallery is going to become obsolete uh, overnight and i think you know like uh, the virtual exhibitions are really important that i think the role of curation is still going to be there i don't think it's going to go away because if you look at some of the nft sites which just display all assorted artworks i think some of them to find the gems is uh, more difficult so maybe that is also an art tech um, tool that will have that helps you find things that are similar to those that you like or that you own in your collection. Unfortunately, Lucy Middleton couldn't be with us uh, for personal reasons, and and so so um, uh, that uh, JP Fabri, unfortunately, both of them couldn't be here. But I want to build on what you were saying about the the curatorial 
experience? What is the role, and maybe this is over to you, Maria and Olga, what's the role of the curator in all this? What, what do you curate when we're talking about these uh, technological developments, these different interfaces, um, artificial intelligence, creating work, co-creating work? It's, I think it's been really interesting when we had the VR exhibition. Um, Imperia have a curation um, program that allows you to curate the entire space. And to be honest, I really enjoyed that much more than going on a ladder and having to <laughs> hang everything on the wall. But like from a curatorial point of view, um, that will always, I agree completely with Angelo, that will always be there. So curation in terms of exhibitions, curation in terms of selection of artwork, selection of artists, um, I think that will never die out in, in, in any form, being physical and, and digital. I think that will, will always um, be a highlight of, of the art world. Yeah, I think curation is inc incredibly important, both in the physical world, but in the digital world as well, because a uh, badly curated virtual show, nobody wants to see that. Um, hence, we've built a curation tool. Uh, we used to do curation for our galleries um, in-house before, so I've curated quite a few shows uh, in kind of early 2020 for them. But uh, yeah, I think it's incredibly important in terms of the overall impression that the artwork makes, uh, the way it's hung, the way it's presented in, uh, yeah, in any kind of space, whether it's physical or virtual. So I don't think um, curation tools are going to go away. And what we're seeing now, uh, some of the galleries we're working with, even if they're kind of trying to temporarily go more on the physical experience since everything reopened in the UK last month, um, they're still using the digital tools to help them curate because what we saw galleries doing before would be either like paper models was cut out printouts that they stick to it or um, PowerPoint presentations, which make no sense to curate a show um, versus now you can just go into your gallery and like quickly do the hang and give it to the um, planning team and kind of share it between yourselves. Uh, so yeah, I think, I think use of digital tools for curation is definitely something that's missing in the art world. But, but not the digital curator. Um, I think that still needs a human touch, to be honest. <laughs> Maria, would you agree with me? Angela, you disagree. I no, I, no. I think that I think that it always needs a human touch. But I think where where the digital art, um, the digital tools may actually help is in finding similar artworks, um, and and it's quite amazing at how poor some of the algorithms actually still are. That you need to put a lot of information about an artwork. It cannot just visually assess it and do that. But I think over time AI is actually getting better at this. I mean, when you look at the deep fake technology, for example, which is it's getting better and better uh, as time goes by. Um, the inverse of that is a curation technology. When you think about it, once you can generate something, then you can assess it. So this is the beauty of AI is that, you know, and, and I constantly read research papers about this and uh, they become obsolete after two months. So it's actually quite hard to keep up uh, with the developments. And this is another, uh, I think, area is like getting an artwork and the artist being able to use it to create variants of the artwork that they've created. So I think this, this could also be an interesting uh, tool, um, for example, with the generative adversarial networks and other tools to be able to create variants of the same artwork. And also possibly having an artwork that is maybe static or with video and having the tool create something nice, for example, to project around the around the artwork itself. For example, if I have the artwork in my living room, I want to project something that complements it around the whole room, to have that ambience, to have that aura around it. I don't know if we have any comments from our participants or questions from the participants um, uh, before we, we start concluding our, our conversation uh, today. I'm, you know, every, possible seminar, webinar I've had in the past 15 months spoke about how COVID is destroying us or destroying our industry or 
you know, and, and of course it has and still has, it continues to have a, a, a very a negative impact on us. But if you had to think of the best thing that has emerged in the relationship between, yeah, in, in, in what you've experienced in, of course, technology and, and art and the art tech, what would that be and, and why? I mean, from my end, um, collaboration, like people came more together um, through technology, in fact, but I felt we felt um, a continuous need to connect in, and find new ways of connecting online. I think that is one of the best and most significant things that happened from a human and community perspective. Digitally, obviously, we were challenged to explore new things and, and we discovered new things that can help us even when COVID is over. So um, I think that these two are the main things, maybe common, but they're, they're the two, two things that's, that are changing the uh, market we're working in. And just to dig deep a little bit further there, um, what, did you identify any issues with the technology itself um, that you think needs to be addressed from your end? You discussed, the, you, you know, you, you've explained how it helped communication, engaging on a more global level. Um, but did it fail on, on, on one aspect or another where, you know, technology needs to be developed further? Um, clearly point. connectivity and, and, and <laughs> no, I, I think I think um, uh, as much as it has helped during COVID and 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 we discovered new things and we're exploring new things but from my personal perspective we also um, realized how important the physical space is as well so that realization of also being, um, of, of, of feeling the need to be also in a physical space, um, that deprivation of the physical space, I think um, when we go back to normal, it will be a plus and we will appreciate it more. From a human and personal perspective, no digital <laughs> implementation here. Olga? Um, I think from the positive perspective, um, I probably two things for us. It's the acceleration of things in a sense that, you know, everyone thought this is where the world is going. The world is going to be virtual, but maybe in 10 years, God knows when. Um, but it kind of just accelerated things so fast. And I think there's such a benefit to it, not from the perspective that, yes, it helped people through the pandemic to kind of keep their doors open, at least virtually. Um, but in the longer run, in terms of accessibility in terms of sustainability um if you think about like shipment of artwork from london to hong kong four times back and forth um and things like that so definitely the speed at which things started happening um was a very nice shift to see uh and also perhaps the international aspect of things because you know we're all in different countries now and back in the day before COVID, would be like you're doing a conference and all you have to be in the same room. So you don't have to travel or, um, or you can't attend it. And it happened with kind of all, all the different um, aspects to say we did an accelerator, which was based in LA. And as much as I like to travel, I don't really want to move to LA for six months. Um, so this kind of stuff of being able to be broad international and also like the international access to talent and um, not needing to restrict yourself to your location I think that was something that was um, really positive, perhaps, that, that came out of COVID. Um, on the negative side, yeah, the human touch is still good. You know, it's, it's exciting to, to go and meet people and to, to see people in person. But it's also nice to know that um, you can always kind of meet someone over Zoom or if you don't have time, it, this option is still there. Indeed. Angelo? Yes, I think that, uh, yeah, there have been a lot of positives that have been mentioned by, by Maria and Olga. Um, I think uh, also the acceptance of people, for example, to buy artwork online, I think this has really, really increased and this is a very positive aspect. 
I think that people are now trusting online purchases much more than before. I think, you know, there was no choice really. Um, but I think this has accelerated again also the, the, the creation of the market. And I think it's going to be here to stay. I think also the creation and melding of AR, of AI also, I think it is now more acceptable. And uh, it has in general uh, accelerated, you know, uh, yeah, the, the e-commerce the, and the adoption of these technologies by an, a few years. So I think there was something positive out of it. Um, I, I also think that people had more time on their hands to, uh, to think around with digital technologies. So I do feel that maybe instead of people going out partying, they were actually doing creative stuff um, indoors. Obviously, there is the negative, the negative aspect of, yeah, of the loss of human touch. I don't think that anything can replace that, especially when it comes to networking with new people that you haven't met before. I think that it is much more hard to do. And this is something that I feel is a challenge also for uh, digital creatives on how to create virtual worlds that make it easier for you to meet new people and to express yourself there maybe as an avatar, maybe as an alter ego, and uh, I think that, you know, having more and more artists involved in this rather than just tech nerd techies, you know, who, who may have, you know, very good coding skills, but not the flair to actually make it look nice and make it pleasant to interact with. I think this, uh, this is accelerating that process of bringing the two both together in a nicer way. So I do feel that the world has taken a turn towards the digital. I don't think it's going to go back completely ever. Um, uh, so, you know, even meetings, I think I, I, I like to meet people in person, but I don't miss the travel. So for certain types of meetings, I think it is much easier to do so. Um, so I do feel that there will be a positive legacy and hopefully we'll be able to take advantage of it and move on forward towards a more digital, more creative, more um, human AI collaboration kind of future. And I think with those wise words, uh, I'd like to conclude the session. Uh, thank you all for your, your insights and a bit of provocations as well. It got me thinking a lot of, about a lot of things. And, I, and I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that, this, uh, that, that you know, new technologies are really, really, and become even more important to, to the art world. Um, so it's kind of probably up to each and every one of us to uh, engage with, with that. Um, so thank you, Olga. Thank you, Maria. Um, thank you, Angelo, for your time. Um, thank you to all the participants who were with us for the first uh, uh, day. Uh, we'll continue these conversations tomorrow. We'll wrap up earlier. I did promise a little break, but we'll have a, um, an, uh, an earlier uh, time to, for you to go and grab a, a beer or a glass of wine because it is ultimately Friday night and I know we may not be able to party as Angelo said but probably we can hang out a little bit somewhere uh, and think about today's thoughts. Until then I will see you all tomorrow morning. Um, sharp start 10 o'clock. Um, so thank you all and have a wonderful evening. Thank you.